Um, good evening and welcome to our 12th episode of Sports Medicine Conferences on uh, anterior re uh, cruciate rehab and high level sports. My name is Stan Conti. I'm the moderator for tonight. Uh, we're sponsored by Conti Sports Performance, CSBT in Scottsdale and powered by Conti Injury Analytics. Our speakers today tonight are uh, Lynn Snyder uh, Mackler, Lenny McCrini, and Holly Silvers Grinelli. We are fortunate to have these three speakers because they can easily be considered some of the most knowledgeable and experienced researchers, physical therapists, and athletic trainers on the complex subject of rehab of ACL in, uh, athletes. Um, and there's been a recent, um, even more considerable attention on this subject, especially on the increased incidence of ACLs early and late rehab, open versus closed kinetic uh, chain exercises, male versus female athletes, return to play, and the reoccurrence of ACL injuries on the same, as well as the uh, contralateral knee. So we're going to get into that uh, in, in great detail, detail in these speakers. Uh, a couple of housekeeping issues. Uh, we have been approved for 2.0 EBP CEUs uh, for athletic trainers and 0.2 CEUs for the NSCA. Uh, many thanks to Nancy Patterson Flynn and Carolyn May for their work in getting uh, those approved. As in the past, CEUs are free of charge for the live episodes. You must fill out the survey on the Survey Monkey at the end of the program to get your CEUs. That's per BOC rules. Um, when you leave the episode, you'll get a link to the survey. Uh, please fill out it as soon as possible. Uh, you'll get a reminder or an email with a link uh, again in 24 hours. Please fill out the survey by Thursday night so we can get the certificates to you. Nancy Flynn will be sending those certificates out uh, uh, within a week uh, of tonight. Please be patient with Nancy uh, uh, as uh, she sends them out. Uh, she just delivered her third baby, Carter, about two weeks ago. So she's a little bit busy right now. Um, as always, a recording of tonight's episode will be posted at our website at CSBT at ContiPerformance.com. Within a week to review, you can view that at any time and for free. Uh, we continue to, uh, uh, to work uh, providing video on demand for the past episodes and hope to have that site up soon. Uh, we will uh, that allow you to view the episodes and obtain CEUs for a nominal charge. Um, um, uh, we could uh, please enter all the questions and answer your questions on the Q and A, not in the chat uh, area. We don't use that, and we'll have about 30 minutes or more uh, for Q and A after the sessions. Um, uh, I want to thank the speakers; uh, they're they're volunteering their time uh, to do this and keep the cost down, so we can keep providing this for for free. Um, and uh, they really make the difference on this. Uh, you may want to uh, uh, take a screenshot or. A picture of uh, Nancy Flynn's email and uh, on the certificates. It's Nancy P. Flynn 2 at gmail.com. Okay, so let's uh, start off with our first speaker. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, first of my disclosures, uh, just I'm a consultant to Major League Baseball and some base MLB organizations, and I'm the owner of Conti Injury Analytics and uh, CSBT. Okay, so uh, then. Um, Lennon is uh, obviously a PTATC with uh, her doctorate uh, as well. Uh, some of her highlights are that she's an uh, alumni a distinguished professor at the uh, Department of Physical Therapy uh, and the 2009 Francis Allison Faculty Award uh, for the high, as one of the university's highest faculty's honor. She also maintains an active physical therapy practice at the University of Delaware and serves as a rehab consultant to college amateur and professional athletes. Um, her education is from John Hopkins uh, in her bachelor's, University of Pennsylvania Phys Physical Therapy, um, University of Pennsylvania, uh, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania and uh, her master's and Boston University, um, which is uh, where I got my uh, doctorate in PT, and I think a uh, pretty good school, I think. Um, uh, her appointments uh, are long and, and distinguishing uh, as a professor at Department of Physical Therapy at University of Delaware, um, a director of sports physical therapy residency at University of Delaware, uh, academic director, and she's an adjunct associate uh, professor, research professor uh, at Thomas Jefferson University in Pennsylvania uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, she's authored more than 250 articles, 30 book chapters, 
Um, she serves as the editor of board of the Orthopedic uh, Today and also uh, joint in JOR and has given more than 1,000 presentations. So this will be 1,001 on her research <laughs> in US and 40, 40 foreign countries. Unbelievable, really. So, and this is a, a picture of her family and we're gonna turn it over to her so she can tell you all these great pe people that she has in her family. Thanks, Lynn. Hi, everybody. Stan asked for a family picture um, and that went away, but that's okay. I'll just tell you about it. We have five, uh, four sons and a daughter all in their thirties. Um, so we have five daughters-in-law and a son-in-law well, actually almost, almost one daughter-in-law. One's getting married this summer. Top left uh, is expecting a baby in June. And then we have uh, Sam, Sadie, and Sawyer in the upper right-hand corner and Sophia in the bottom left-hand corner. So four grandchildren. Sophia just turned two. And the new baby will be probably our first non s and sam is happy that he's going to finally have more, be more not just the only boy so let me share my screen and let's get started do i have control nancy i do right yes you do great thank you hold on drop this for a sec here we go. Welcome, everybody. Oops. Oh, okay. So we're going to talk about rehab for the high-level athlete to return to sports after ACL injury. I have no disclosures. So our objectives are to present the most current evidence for management and an approach to counseling and treating young active patients after ACL injury that includes non-operative management. So what are successful outcomes? We studied this um, by asking uh, 800 physical therapists, sports, athletic trainers, and sports orthopedic surgeons in, in the US and in Europe about, we asked them a whole bunch of questions like, what do you use? What do you think is, is, uh, is, is success? And we asked them about, patient reported outcomes and quad strength and all these other things. And only two things came up. One was, and I think you could have all guessed this, return to sports at the previous activity. So does this really happen? The Moon cohort, which was one of our first outcomes uh, registries here in the US, showed their American football players. I want you to just look at these numbers because they're, they just go across continents even. 63% of college football, this is American football players, and 69% of high school um, go back to sport at all. 43% of the players were able to return to play at the same self-described performance level. About 30% felt they couldn't perform at the level they had before their ACL tear, and 30% weren't able to return to play at all. So I thought, okay, football. This was about, um, you know, in the, in the, in the, the mid part of the, the last decade. Uh, but here's their soccer. So moon soccer was only 72% of soccer players went back to play. Then Claire Ardern, who is now the, the editor in chief of JOSBT, uh, produced a meta-analysis in 2011 and looked at the injuries across all the literature and look at that number, 63% return to pre-injury level of sports, 44% to competitive sports. So um, here we go again. This is from Dr. Andrews and his group for 10 years at the NFL, 61% returned. Now, I want you to pay attention to the bottom left graph. That shows what patients think happens. Um, so this group, in 2014, 94% of primary and 84% of revision ACLs expected to return to the same level of activity with no or only slight restrictions. It's a really big mismatch between what they expect and what happens. The other thing that everybody answered in that question about what are successful outcomes is no re-injury. So does this really happen? Well, in moon soccer, it was a 20% re-injury rate in women. 
Paterno at all, this is the Hewitt Prevention Cohort, 20% in those 18 and younger. Um, Don Shelborn, who's an orthopedic surgeon in Indiana, 17% in college age and younger. Leo Pinchewski, that's Australia, 17%, higher and younger, higher in males. And all rates were higher with allografts in young athletes. Um, contralateral ACLs, 12 to 25%, higher if you're younger, higher if you're female. OA, 45 to 70% at 15 years, higher in those who return to strenuous sports. Yet look at the bottom right hand graph again, 98% say they think they have no or only a slightly increased risk of OA. Uh, revision ACL, worse outcomes in the short term and more OA and disability in the long term. Kate Webster and her group, again, in looking at a whole bunch of data in 2014, showed in patients younger than 20 years at the time of surgery, almost 30% sustained a subsequent ACL injury to either knee. The odds for sustaining an ACL graft rupture or contralateral injury increases six and threefold respectively for patients younger than 20. Returning to a cutting and pivoting sport increases the odds of graft rupture by a factor of almost four and contralateral rupture by a factor of five. So our, our patients want to go back to these cutting and pivoting sports. And that in and of itself is a huge risk for re-injury. And a positive family history doubled the odds for both graft rupture and contralateral ACL injury. Here in 2016, from that same group, from Webster's group, secondary ACL injury, ipsilateral plus contralateral for patients younger than 25 was 21%. And for athletes who returned to sport was 20%. Combining these risk factors, the athletes younger than 25 who returned to sport have a secondary ACL injury rate of 30%. So this was a, a, a basically a headline of an editorial in British Journal of Sports Medicine in 2016, is it time to be honest regarding outcomes of ACL reconstructions? Should we be quoting 55 to 65% success rate for high level athletes? And that's my, the editorial is, ends there. Um, I think this is what non-operative management or delayed reconstruction outcomes should be compared to, not some mythical 95 to 100% good to excellent results. So our typical preoperative goals when we see a patient after ACL injury is no preoperative flexion contracture or quad lag, quad contraction with a good superior glide of the patella, normal patellar mobility, little to no effusion and walking without a limp, so, uh, the so-called quiet knee. Is that enough and what's our evidence? So does surgical delay help, hurt or make no difference? The only randomized trial is from Ricard Frobel, who's a physical therapist in, uh, in Sweden, and his group that included uh, a multidisciplinary team. It's called the Kanun Study. Their five-year report showed that there was no difference in any outcome between those who were operated on straight away, those who were operated on later, and those who didn't have an operation at all. The message to the medical expert experts who are treating young active patients with ACL injuries is that it may be better to start by considering rehab rather than operating straight away. Um, our, the recommendation from our Delaware Oslo cohort, it, we, did a, we do, did a five week progressive neuromuscular and strength training program that short term progressive exercise therapy programs should be incorporated in the early stage after ACL entry to optimize knee function as a first step in the preparation to return to previous activity or not with or without surgery. Rehab should also incorporate exercise and postures for secondary prevention. So um, here, is, here are data from our Delaware Oslo cohort um, in the upper left-hand corner comparing our entire cohort to the U.S. Moon cohort, and then uh, at the bottom right comparing our patients to the Norwegian Knee Ligament Registry. So here's our, co our comparison to the Knee Ligament Registry. And, and as you can see, the um, Delaware Oslo cohort is, li is listed as Oslo, and um, the, the uh, registry is usual care. We were better in, in every single patient reported outcome. In the moon, compared to the moon data, we looked at the IKDC at two years, and again, we're, we're about 10 points higher. And in terms of function, our, we were about again, 10% higher in the patients who return to sport. 
So what do we counsel patients or what should we counsel patients after ACL injury? Just because you have ACL reconstruction doesn't mean you'll return to, this, to sports at all and most likely not at the same level of performance. Your risk of re-injury is high in the near term, higher if you're younger, higher ipsilaterally, that is graft rupture if you're male, and contralaterally if you're female. Regardless of surgery, your risk of OA is high in the long, in, in, high in the long term. And if you need revision surgery, which again with these high re-injury rates is, is pretty high, uh, your risk of OA is higher. This is our ACL algorithm at the University of Delaware for level one and two athletes. That's jumping, pivoting, cutting, racket, racquetball, racket sports, uh, baseball, things like that skiing. So all patients are educated on the outcome of operative or non-operative management. And then the question is the patient planning ACL reconstruction. So we have a non-operative management on the left. We have operative management on the right, which is clearly the most common for our young active patients. And then in the middle, we have this temporary or delayed ACL reconstruction. Those are for people who want to complete a competitive season. And I will talk about that in a minute. So the first thing, no matter what, with all of our patients is impairment resolution. And all of you know that if the patients come right away or if you see them right on the field, that this isn't particularly difficult. But often the patients go to a primary care doctor, then they go to the orthopedic surgeon, and then they finally make it to PT. And it could be up to a couple of weeks before you see them. And then getting the even to a quiet knee is really hard. Once we have the impairments resolved, we do a screening exam that includes hop testing and two uh, patient reported outcome measures. And the hop testing is, um, and you can, you know, we have a lot of data that shows that this doesn't extend the injury. You can do this on patients um, who are ACL deficient. Uninvolved leg tested first, two practice hops we do, single leg hop, crossover hop, triple hop, and a timed six meter hop. And here we're trying to figure out who is a potential coper and who is a non-coper. So we won't let people try that uh, temporary return to play unless they're a potential coper. So to be a potential coper, they have to have had fewer than one episode of giving way uh, since the initial injury, greater than 80% limb symmetry index, index on the time top, 80% on the knee outcome survey activities of daily living score, and 60% on the global rating, which is the single question that asks them, how is your knee performing now compared to how it performed before surgery? And the failure to meet any of those criteria um, they, it makes them a non-coper. So we'll talk, I'm going to talk to you a, min a minute about can individuals return to sports after ACL injury without reconstruction? The answer is yes. So <clears throat> why do people consider non-operative management? Some people may wish to delay or avoid surgery. There are also different pa practice patterns. You can see that I have an international portfolio here, set of collaborators in different parts of the world. That means there are some places where there are waiting lists. Yes, you tore your ACL, you can have your surgery in 18 months. <clears throat> so what do you tell them to do in the interim? Um, surgical reconstruction and return to sports are not an effective strategy for preventing early onset knee OA and not all patients need to have surgery. So our management algorithm is no effusion, full knee range of motion, greater than 70% quad strength, able to hop on the injured leg without pain. <clears throat> and then, if, they're, if all these criteria are met and, and they pass the test, then they have 10 visits in uh, progressive perturbation training, agilities, and strength training. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, and non-coper, as I said. So here we are, right? Um, if they pass potential coper, they get the either temporary re return to sport or delayed. Um, and then if they are a non-coper, we still give them the opportunity to continue with rehabilitation if they want to and uh, or undergo operative management. And the treatment for the potential copers is 10 visits of progressive perturbation training, agilities and strength training, regardless of whether they're having surgery or not. Um, on the non-copers, we give them that option of doing the same thing. So the rehabilitation that we do, when you do that training for people who are Kelly Fitzgerald in his randomized controlled trial when he was a graduate student in my group in 2000 showed that if you do that, the patients who 
take part in this perturbation training are six times more likely to return to sports without an episode of giving way. Um, and we only had one failure in that perturbation group. So here's the perturbation training. It's just moving support, su su the, the support surfaces. And we have um, lots of videos uh, uh, that, I can, that are on the U UDPT website under, in our clinic under for rehabilitation professionals. You can find all of this stuff. We do 10 treatments administered biweekly to as frequently as daily and the number of sessions per week and program progression are dependent on the ability of the patient to appropriately perform the techniques and the response of the patient's knee joint regarding effusion and knee pain. Um, they then go through a running progression and agilities. And then we do the functional testing again. The same testing battery as the screening exam but different passing criteria. And these are the same passing criteria that we use for our post-op patients. So for the screening exam, you see what they have to pass in the middle. For, the fun for return to activity, it has to be 90% or greater on limb symmetry index, index for quad strength, all single leg hops, and then also for the two patient reported outcome measures. So here, here are our data from our Oslo part of our cohort the one-year follow-up for non-operative and operative. And if you look at the non-operative and operative values, you see the overall return to sports levels are exactly the same. Sports frequency for, is exactly the same. The only thing that favors the operative group is the KT1000 side-to-side -side difference in millimeters, which is completely unsurprising because the non-operative group should still have laxity because they didn't have reconstruction. And in every other case, the non-op group's doing better. I don't think those, even though they're statistically different, I don't think they're, they are clinically meaningful. However, it still favors the non-op group. The other thing that we recently showed is when we look at these people two years after, whether they had, when they had, when they have surgery, what we found is the COPER classification changes and it's associated with two-year success. So as you, they go through that, that preoperative 10 sessions of neuromuscular and strength training, nearly half of the non-COPERs become potential COPERs. And that COPER classification post-training was strongly, very strongly associated with two-year success. Potential COPERs had three times the odds of success compared to non-COPERs. And those who remained non-copers, where you, you would think, oh, there's still no copers after that, they should have surgery. They had no benefit from ACL reconstruction. And that suggests to us that they probably need even more intensive pre-op rehab. So what about after ACL reconstruction? Our post-ACL uh, reconstruction starts with impairment resolution from in the first week. Inflammation control, we want full active knee extension, patellar mobility, quad strengthening, and gait training. And, you know, we use, you could see lots of stretching. We do wall, these wall slides. We do a lot of active motion for them to get, because muscles are the best, muscle contraction is the best way to get rid of swelling and aggressive elevation, like you see on that wall. At, if you do that in the first week, from here, it's all about optimal loading of the tissues. And I have here the weight begins, and here are people at Disney World, right? And it, we call it Disney World Rehab. So you get in line like you are at Disney World, and you wait and wait and wait and wait and wait, and then you go through the ride, and then you go to the next one, and you wait and wait and wait. So here, we're all waiting for the tissues to heal, and then are optimally loading them during those rides. All right, so I want to get at what Stan talked about with open and closed chain kinetic. So here is our data from um, Vermont from the mid 80s. And this shows isometric, isometric quad contraction with 30 Newton meters of extension torque, open chain 4.4, right? Strain, percent strain. Squatting with a sport cord, 4% strain, okay? Now let's, that's not different, by the way. Here's a, here are data from Lou DeFreit's lab at, at Duke, and they're showing ACL length and relative strain during walking. So you remember from the slide before, 4%, right? And here you, 
hold on, let me back up. Here you can see in the middle one, look at the relative strain. This is during walking. Twice, right, the strain is 13% and 10%, which is two to three times higher than doing open chain knee extension, which is not different from closed chain. Here again, same group, and you see here again, um, on the bottom graph, 5% and 12.5%, okay? Still much higher than open chain and closed chain. So open chain knee extension with resistance, 4%. Squatting with a sport cord, 4%. Mini squat, 3.6%. Walking, each step, 13 to 14%. All right, and this, um, and this shows what happens when you don't do that. So uh, the group at Ohio State, led by Matt Ithburn and Laura Schmidt, have, they, they have done a bunch of studies with patients who've been cleared by somebody, generally their surgeon, to return to play. They then bring them into the lab and test them, quad strength, hop tests, and self-reported knee function, and see if they actually pass any of the criteria. And if you look at this, um, if you look at this graph, what you see is hardly any of them pass. So they're just being sent back to play without passing any of these criteria. And the younger they are, the worse it is. So you have to measure quad strength. So if you don't have an isokinetic dynamometer, use a 1RM on a knee extension machine. If you use uh, the handheld dynamometers and leg press, both overestimate the strength of the involved limb. So if you have to use them, then your quad index has to be 100% or more. This is our typical setup. Greg Seymour is my, one of our uh, therapists, and he is screaming, kick, 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 kick to her. And we do a burst superimposition where we also are assessing inhibition. The other thing that we use for progression is effusion testing. So it's just a simple sweep test. You can see it in the bottom left. You sweep the swelling out and then you try to sweep it back and you look in that medial sulcus where the finger is in the upper and you are grading it based on the amount of fluid that comes back. This is from Sturgill et al. Uh, high, high inter rater and uh, intra rater reliability. It's in JOSPT. We also use these soreness rules, and that means joint soreness. We would like their muscles to be sore, but if their joints are sore, that indicates that something's going on, okay? So uh, this is another, so if you, we have a paper published on our practice guidelines from 2012 that has all of this information in it. It's Adams et al., JOSPT 2012. So then we do the same testing that we did for the non-ops. Right, these, uh, we have these tracks in our clinic. We do, we want the quad strength index to be greater than 90, the four single leg hop tests to be greater than 90, the outcome uh, KOS ADLS to be greater than 90, and the global rating score greater than 90. So passing that return to activity testing and running progression doesn't mean they're cleared to go back to sport. It means they can be into practice, not direct return to pre-injury level and activity, and then they have to go through an on-field on field or on-court progression. So what happens? Does this, does this help to go through this whole thing? Um, in our Delaware also cohort, Hega Grindham published in 2016, a paper that probably was the most impactful paper clinically of any paper we've ever published. Um, she showed that only 5.6 of the percent of the patients who pass the return to sport criteria before returning to level one sports, that is jumping, pivoting, and cutting sports, suffered re-injuries, compared to almost 40% of those who returned without passing. And then even though quad strength is part of those criteria, more symmetrical quad strength in and of itself prior to return significantly reduced the risk of knee injury. Now, as Webster showed earlier on, as I re reported, those who returned to level one sports had an almost five times higher risk of re-injury than those who did not. And the risk of re-injury, this is a big one about biology, was reduced by about 58% for each month return to sport was delayed till nine months after surgery. And these data actually 
continued out to 12 months, but we didn't have enough statistical power to show that. So um, using these simple decision rules could reduce second injury by 84%. That's a big deal. Um, there was a, the group from Aspatar. This is in professional athletes. They did almost the exact same thing. They just added um, a running t-test. Otherwise, it's the exact same criteria that the likelihood of graft rupture, if you don't meet these criteria before returning to sport, is associated with a four times greater risk of rupture. So passing return to sport test batteries is associated with a decreased risk of further knee injury by 72%. Passing them is associated with a decreased odds of any ACL injury by 74%. Passing return to test batteries is associated with a decreased odds of ACL graft rupture. And regarding contralateral injury, there just weren't enough people who went, who failed and went back that tore their contralaterals to be able to make any kind of meaningful statement about that. So I'm gonna come back to that, what Haga showed about waiting to return. Biology matters. Here's a from Constance Chu's group in San Francisco. The MRI here, show, this is looking at um, graft healing. The MRI shows elevations within six months after surgery, relative stability between six months and a year, and then, a, and then a significant decrease between one and two years suggestive of remodeling follow, followed by continued graft maturation all the way through the second year after surgery. We also, before they go back during their return to play, we do secondary prevention program. These prevention exercises are based on the, what Holly's gonna talk about, so all the, based on their um, primary prevention. And, and when we do that, our two-year ACL re-injury rate in our patients in our ACL sports randomized controlled trial was 2.5%. Um, we only had one athlete who was re, who re-injured in two years. And he had a second ACL injury almost just before two years. The median age of the men was 21.5%. All were regular participants in level one and two sports. Um, at two years, they'd all return to sport, 95% at their pre-injury level. Um, this is our entire cohort from ACL Sports, and we're comparing these to our Delaware Oslo cohort, Moon, and, and um, we did much better in activity level, IKDC, Coos Paint, all the Cooses, and, the IK, and uh, their function. In terms of the women, all were athletes, 100% returned to sport, 87% at their self-reported activity level. And look at those two-year results on the right. Um, QIs of 100, hops, hundreds, great um, self-reports. So that's using the exactly what I showed you. Um, in the women, we had four graft ruptures. Uh, which was 10.25%, which is not that different. It's a little bit lower, but not much. Um, and our contralateral injuries were much reduced compared to what's in the literature. So in summary, the best predictors of post-op success is pre-op condition. You need to counsel your patients. 10 sessions of rehab after achieving a quiet knee that includes progressive quadricep strengthening and neuromuscular training improves two-year post-op IKDC and CUS scores by clinically meaningful amounts over best care, and half of non-copers become potential copers, which also improves post-op outcomes. You need to do progressive post-operative rehab. You need to do return to activity testing. It's best to do a secondary uh, prevention program, and doing this, our five-year outcomes are, are among the best reported. This is our my uh, are my collaborators from the Delaware Oslo cohort, my, my husband, Michael X, um, Lars Engerbretsen and Myrna Risberg from, from, uh, from Norway and I am a, Michael and I are proud Delawareans and this is my friend, Jill Biden and her husband who I think you all know. Thank you. Thank you, that was great. Very nice, very nice and um, 
Uh, I think there'll be a lot of questions in regards to all this. And I kind of remind everybody uh, to start putting their questions in now on the Q&A. Uh, we've got a, a bunch of them already, but uh, thank you, Lynn. Okay. You're welcome. Um, okay. Need to, there, uh, Nancy's going to switch up. We're going to have Lenny uh, Karina on here in a second. But uh, again, uh, make sure that uh, um, you uh, do the Q and A. Uh, add those questions as you as you think of. We'll be doing those at the end. Okay, and we're having a little technical difficulty here. Okay, so we're going to introduce um, Lenny. Um, he is a, a PT um, and a board certified sports physical therapist. He's uh, the co-founder and director of physical therapy at Champion Physical Therapy um, in uh, Waltham, uh, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, his uh, assistant PT uh, is uh, Mike Reinold. So he, uh, he has to put up with that all the time. He was a consultant for the, the uh, Tampa Bay Rays for 10 years, and he's a clinical researcher and educator. Uh, bachelor degrees in biotechnology uh, from Worcester Polytechnical Institute, and uh, another Boston University. He got his master's at Boston University. Uh, he's, as I said, the co-founder of Champion Physical Therapy, um, and uh, you can uh, follow him and talk with him at lennyvacrina.com. Uh, uh, he also does MedBridge uh, short courses and CEUs uh, and uh, evaluation and treatment of the knee with Mike Reynolds. And this is his uh, beautiful family, wife uh, Angela and daughter Adley. Um, Lenny, take it away. Awesome. <clears throat> Thank you, Stan. Um, Thank you, everyone. And wow, Lynn, good stuff as usual. Um, I am going to share my screen and we let's get started because I got a lot to cover here. Um, okay, so great job, Lynn. As usual, you guys hopefully can see this and I'm going to carry on. So I'm going to kind of hit some of Lynn's stuff and then I'm going to, I think I'm just going to kind of go off of my own and uh, see my perspective on ACL rehab. I tend to talk a lot about this um, in the, um, you know, online and social media. And I'm having trouble advancing my slides here. Hmm. Let me see. Oh, there we go. There we go. We're back. Okay. Uh, so I have no conflicts of interest. I have nothing to disclose. Um, I wish I had something to disclose, then I'd probably be doing better. But um, so as we talked about, ACL rehab is complex. It's happening. I mean, it's it's crazy how much uh, this is going on. We can no longer say it's an epidemic, right? Uh, used to say that, and now it's like, you know, kind of puts in perspective what's going on in the world. We really cannot say that. Um, but we are learning so much more about ACL rehab. We're learning so much more about uh, what's best, but we are still lacking uh, a lot, unfortunately. So hopefully I can clarify a little uh, what I tend to do because there's so many different factors that lead to uh, the retail rates that we're seeing, right? And a lot of things that we can't control. We can't control the weather. We can't control notch size, intercondylar notch size. We can't control the slope of the tibia, right? Those are going to be more surgeon stuff, but or genetic stuff. But we can control hip and core strength. We can control quad strength, things of that nature. This is one of my uh, Instagram posts that I stole uh, from last year. And you can see uh, all the factors that may be uh, considered in some of our patients and why these retail rates are so high. And then you get freaky stuff, right? Like this is a baseball player at Arizona Diamondback and just crossing home plate. So again, his external surface, it wasn't weather, it was the surface. He crossed home plate and he tore his, uh, he blew out his knee. And as you can see, I'm not going to play that too much because it's kind of uh, you know, gruesome to see, but I think he's doing really well and, and uh, my best to him. But it's not just the ACL we worry about, right? We worry about bone bruises. We worry about cartilage. We worry about uh, meniscus. So many different things that are contributing to not just uh, the short-term, but long-term outcomes of these patients. Bone bruises, I think we kind of underestimate and underrate them, but they are nearly occurring in 100% 
of the injuries that we see, the ACL injuries that we see. And then you can see five, seven years out, the loss of cartilage and the result in uh, long-term issues that may occur in patients that have these ACL injuries with resultant uh, bone bruises and cartilage loss. It's stuff that as PTs, we can't control that, but we can help with the stresses on the knee joint. So again, it's not an isolated injury, and it's also not uh, an injury that just affects the, the, the quad locally. You're going to have contralateral effects, which will help us uh, during the rehab process because we can strengthen the contralateral side and get some gains on the ipsilateral side or the involved side. So we do have deficits that occur, and, and Lynn and her group show that in one of her studies that if we're testing somebody's knee out, um, there is going to be uh, a degradation in the contralateral knee. So to use that other knee to use that for uh, return to sport testing, I think we're doing a disservice. And we'll talk about that in a little while. But again, it's not just, it's not just the ACL, right? It's so much more going on. But a little depressing, let's move on. Why does all of this matter? Because retear rates are way too high. So somebody tears their ACL, there's probably a one in four or a one in three chance that they are going to re-tear their ACL. So the highest risk of having a, a, another tear of their ACL is tearing it in the first place. But we know this, right? Most of our ACLs, most of our injuries that we see, you, you have a hamstring strain, what's the number one risk of re-injuring your hamstring? Because you had a history of a hamstring issue. So same thing with the ACL. It's just our research is telling us this. So Paterno has shown us this. Paterno in another study has shown 29.5% uh, suffered another ACL tear within the first two years. So you get this athlete, they just spent six to nine to 12 months, depending on when you were rehabbing them, right? Uh, maybe five years ago, they were returning in, in, in six months, but hopefully now it's nine months. And then you, they put, put all that time in, they get to their junior or senior in high school, and then within a year or two, they re-tear their ACL. Very depressing for them. Never mind the, the, the effects on their joint, but just the mental, the mental stress. And then never mind females. Unfortunately, females are almost five times greater versus control. So, you know, a female uh, tearing their ACL, I am, I am really counseling them on the importance of getting 110%, 120% back to their, to their pre-level status, if not stronger because of the, the issues with re-tearing that's going on. So younger age and higher level activity in this study, this Wiggins study in AJSM, were the two uh, factors that really contributed to athletes re-tearing their ACL. So again, you have that 15 year old athlete. In my head, when I have that 15, 16 year old athlete in front of me who just had surgery and, I, and they are, you know, they're afraid, they don't know what's going on. In my head, I'm thinking this person probably has a one in three chance of re-tearing their ACL. And in conversation, I'll probably discuss this with the family and almost use scare tactics with them, right? Because if I can get the family to buy in and buy into my program, because I know I can help them prevent it, then they are going to do everything they can. And the kid will buy into the program to, to get better and to put that time and effort in, because this, this is, this is a lot of time and a lot of effort for these kids to be able to, to get back. So, you know, Lynn showed you these studies. I don't have to review this. I think you guys know this pretty much uh, well off already, but we've come a long way uh, since the 1980s when it was immobilization for six weeks. You know, we were playing with our Rubik's Cube. Uh, I'm a product of the 80s, so if you don't get these jokes, sorry. Um, you know, it was just, it was a different world. Pac-Man, Waka Waka, all this stuff. There's unlimited rehab though, right? Insurance was amazing. This was before my time as a PT. Uh, unlimited rehab. You could just rehab for months and get crazy reimbursements. But things changed, right? And, and, and so, but fortunately, our rehab changed. So that 1990 Shelbourne paper was telling us that we could be more aggressive with our patients. So get them out of a cast for six weeks, like cast them at 30 degrees of, of knee flexion for six weeks, and then go to PT after that. Talk about issues with rehab. Uh, but we learned from that study that we could be more aggressive. So we should have better rehab, right? And better outcomes? Well, not necessarily. So uh, when it comes to the ACL rehab, I want to discuss, you know, the rehab is going to be pretty quickly. Uh, it's going to you know, occur really quick. It's probably going to come within the first few days after surgery. Pre-surgery, I want to discuss the different graft types with the patient. Are they going to have a patella tendon graft, a hamstring graft, a quad tendon graft? Uh, what's the status of the meniscus? Usually they don't know that. 
So it's going to be, hopefully they can fix it. If they fix the meniscus, that might change our rehab, depending on the surgeon and how we, how quickly we can progress you, but you want to fix the meniscus. Um, what's the cartilage status? What's the bone bruise status? Um, are there any other injuries involved? All these factors, um, I'm trying to counsel the family and get their questions answered because there's so many things going on. So many things hit them at once. And my job as a PT is to help counsel them pre-surgery and do that prehab uh, aspect of the, of the rehab. So when do we want to begin this? We want to begin this as quickly as possible, right? I just posted today on, um, I think it was today on Instagram. I don't know. I've lost track. What day is it? Um, I just posted a nice prehab that I like to do. And I've got a kid right now that I'm doing it. on. I want to calm the knee down. Lynn talked about this, get the swelling out, get that homeostasis um, that we talk about in getting the knee to, to be full range of motion, no pain, no swelling, um, get them, get their gait normalized, get, get away that from that quad avoidance gait where they're afraid to put weight on that leg and, and get that, get everything normalized. So when they go into surgery, their outcomes will probably be better, right? If you can get, um, get that knee to calm down, then prehab has been shown to help with outcomes long-term. But also during this prehab phase, I like to test their uninvolved side. So Lynn talked about copers and non-copers and she does a great job with that. I tend to see only people that are having surgery. Um, I talk to people about it. I mentioned that some people can give it a trial and most people give it four to six weeks before surgery, but that's doctor's orders. That's because they're prepping for a surgery. So my job is to get everything I can pre-surgery and get baseline because this group in JOSPT in 2017 has shown that if you test the quads immediately after the injury, you're going to get a better idea of how strong they were right at that time of injury. If you wait to test the quads at three months, six months, 12 months after the injury, you're not getting a true picture of what the, the, that person's quadricep, quadricep strength truly was. So when you're using LSI's limb symmetry index, I worry, and that's what this study showed, that patients aren't really passing these tests based off of the strength that they really had at time zero, right? Be just before they tore their ACL. What were their quads status back, then, back at that time? And so for me, when I get somebody pre, pre-op or prehab, I'm getting a quad test. How am I doing it? I'm using a handheld dynamometer. I'm using an isometric handheld dynamometer. Um, and it's not ideal, as Lynn said, but it's something that I can do. Uh, Terry Grindstaff and his group showed a nice way to do that. And I use his model. Uh, that was an uh, International Journal of Sports Physical Therapy. I think it was 2015 and 2017. Um, and so I use that as my kind of go-to because I don't have an isokinetic test. I don't have a knee extension as well. So what can I do? I'm not going to use my hand for manual muscle testing. So I'm using a handheld dynamometer and getting some number. I'm getting something uh, from the person. Post-op principles. So they have surgery. I'm going to quickly hit upon these because I want to, you guys know most of this stuff, but obviously we want to decrease pain, get the swelling out, get full knee extension. Uh, Dr. Shelbourne, um, again, uh, down in Indianapolis talks about if you don't get symmetrical knee hyperextension, and I am constantly putting this on social media, then the patient is not going to do as well as if you got uh, symmetrical knee hyperextension. It's just that important. And he did also show in another study that it doesn't affect graft laxity. So don't be afraid to get knee symmetry, right? If most, a lot of doctors are still get the knee straight and that's all they need. The patients won't feel good with just a straight, a zero degrees of extension knee. They need to have symmetry. So critical that we get that. Get the swelling out. We know that when they have swelling in the knee joint, that's going to affect uh, the quadriceps. You can get atherogenic inhibition, um, which this study showed uh, the muscle becomes inhibited after a surgery. What are the two best ways to get the muscle to come back? Ice. So for all the anti-icers out there, um, ice was the number one and exercise, which again, Lynn mentioned a second ago, exercise is a great way to get swelling out. I can't tell you how many times I have somebody come in with a little fusion in their knee and I have them do some exercise. And at the end of the session, you're thinking, oh, this knee is going to be you know, huge. It's going to look like a balloon. And then bam, their swelling is gone. Right. And so exercise is a great way. And I, so all my patients are going to get exercise pre and post surgery, and that's going to help with their swelling as well. So again, get that extension. Dr. Shelbourne talked about that. Uh, even just a few degrees. So most people have hyperextension. 
most people have about three to five degrees of hyperextension, depending on male versus female. And then you have the hyperlax people that'll be 10 to 15 degrees of hyperextension. You got to get symmetrical knee hyperextension. I can't stress that enough. Some people get mad at me when I say the word hyperextension. It's, it's, uh, it triggers them, but uh, whatever. Um, it's, it's knee extension, but it's, it's symmetry. Um, again, hyperextension, very critical. So this is a couple of ways that uh, we do it. Uh, this is a paper that uh, Kevin and I put out in um, JOSPT in 2012, I believe. Uh, a couple of ways that we work on uh, knee uh, hyperextension and how people can do it at home as well. Kind of basic. But then when they get weight bearing, they can do some retro treadmill walking. Uh, they can do some retro cone walking. Again, I use this every day. This is stuff. This isn't stuff that I, I, I don't use anymore. Or this is stuff that I think is useless. This is critical stuff for balance, coordination, and then getting that hyper uh, that extension moment uh, at the knee. Okay, so eight components. You know, you you can read these slides later on, but this is some of the basic stuff, and it would be great. Zoom is not good with videos, so I love to give examples of this stuff, but Zoom is not good. It's going to be all ratchety for you guys to see. So I'm, I wasn't. I took all my videos out, but these are some basic principles that we use. I love a lot of passive range of motion at the beginning. I want to establish that range of motion for this person, get them feeling comfortable, uh, get that motion back. Uh, at two weeks after surgery, uh, this is when I like to use blood flow restriction. Um, what type of blood flow restriction uh, model are you use? I don't care. Do your research, do your own stuff. Um, there's so many great ones out there. Um, but it has been shown to give not only local effects to the quad, but also proximal and distal effects. So I use it as much as I can early on because they are limited in what they can do. So this is going to help to get quad hypertrophy along with the neuromuscular electrical stimulation I use as well. So the combination of the two, two weeks out of surgery is kind of my go-to. And then I'll slowly pull NMES out of the rehab at about four to six weeks. And then I will keep the blood flow restriction in their program, but just shift it to the end of their um, session. So I like to load them as strong as they can early on uh, at that kind of six to eight week mark after surgery. And then I add blood flow restriction at the end of their PT session with me to kind of get a little bit more hypertrophy and a little bit more kind of that uh, human growth hormone release out of the muscles. So again, we hit that six week after surgery thing. Hopefully they have full motion. I'm still protecting the graph though. Lynn showed that slide and it's a classic slide and it's other slides too that are out there that show that it takes a good uh, year to two for that graft to mature. So I'm still protecting the graft at six to 12 weeks out of surgery, but hopefully they're out of the brace, they're feeling better, they feel like a human again, right? They're walking and they're, they're back at school with their friends, they're feeling good about things. And this is when the rehab really begins in my opinion. But those first four to six weeks after the surgery, to me are the most important part of the rehab. That sets the tone for the person, right? Get their range of motion back, get their swelling out, get their pain down, get them feeling comfortable with this new world that they're living in with this new knee, get them comfortable with me as a Pete, as their rehab uh, specialist, as their PT, because we still got another, you know, eight or nine months to, to get to know each other. So uh, this is that four, first four to six weeks, we are getting buy-in from the person that they are, they're going to uh, get on my back and we're going to take them you know, to the promised land. So again, it's, it's that six weeks to 12 weeks that I am beginning to squat. I'm beginning to do some of the body weight stuff. I'm starting to do some step downs, single leg squat. Um, we're at champion. We're trying to put together a, a, a good program for our patients, right? So we want to begin to teach them how to squat, how to hinge, because we think that those are basic movements that people need to get stronger. So I'm just using a dowel, for example, to teach them how to hinge. Most people that we see 15, 16, 17 years old have never deadlifted, right? So, but that's a, a critical uh, component of ACL rehab, at least in my opinion, is that posterior chain work, glute hamstring work is critical. So we get to teach them some basic movements so they can, you know, get that uh, peach emoji looking butt um, and have them get a progressive uh, loading uh, into their knee and, and lower body. And then you can get creative with some balance stuff. Uh, Lynn talked about perturbation training. I use perturbation training. I, I grew up as a PT uh, under, with Kevin Wilk and, and Mike Reinald down in Birmingham. So that is a, a one thing that we always did for all of our lower body uh, injuries, not just ACL, but um, you know, ankle sprains and knee replacements and anything else was, was some kind of perturbation training because we know that it helps the person to maybe prevent retail rates uh, down the road. So we're now three, four months out, five months out. We're trying to progress them to do 
uh, more involved stuff, right? So we're now trying to, this three month mark is when they usually get cleared to run. I, I, I completely disagree with it. I'm gonna go on the record. This is being recorded. I disagree with running at three months. Why are we running at three months arbitrarily? We have no reason. It's just the doctor says it's time to run at three months. Uh, let's give them something exciting to do. Can they do it, right? Can they even run at three months? Usually, no. You got this like, uh-uh, uh-uh, they're trying to like, like yeah, I, I'm looking, I'm running, I'm running. And it's just, it's miserable. So I feel like as PTs, we need to do a better job of figuring out what's our criteria to begin to run, right? Can they squat their body weight? Can they squat 50% of their body weight? Can they deadlift their body weight? right? I think that's where my head is going with rehab is hitting these critical aspects uh, of the rehab and getting people to figure out and pushing them that if they can squat their body weight, well, then maybe they're ready to run. And so this is my task right now at Champion is coming up with a better return to play program that is not just a test at six months or nine months that involves hop tests. It is something that is going on constantly and we're constantly reassessing these people's programs because doing a, a wall sit for 30 seconds is great, but it's not developing strength and power. It's just the, yeah, we went from 15 second wall sit to a 30 second wall sit. They need more than that. And that's what I'm trying to work on right now. And that's what we'll work on right now uh, with some of our students and our staff is coming up with a specific program for our people because Again, and Lynn hit upon this, and she gave some great slides and great talks, and I have a feeling this is going to be part of our discussion. The return to play testing is not good, right? I'm, I'm sorry, people. How many people are on this? Uh, there's uh, 897 people that are hearing me say, we are not good at our return to play testing. So uh, retail rates are high, right? So one in four, one in three people are retailing their ACLs. Uh, protocols all, are all over the place. Like doctors, a uh, non-weight bearing, limited range of motion. Let's get people back at six months. Let's get, let's get people back at 12 months. Let's not do any PT for two weeks. This is a Boston thing. No PT for two weeks. I mean, it's insane. Who's doing a hamstring on a female? Who's doing an allograft on a female? We're all over the place. So I'm trying to systemize the rehab process um, and, and try to figure out a way that's best for the person that they have to hit certain marks in the rehab. If not, they are not moving on. And that's my test. My test is happening day by day, week by week, month by month, because we have all these different variations that are going on in post-op protocols, uh, graph types, insurance issues, uh, how we testing, how people's fears of getting back, right? Kinesiophobia, uh, the Tampa, the Tampa score. So many, what, what clinical equipment do we have? Not everybody has a biodex. Not everybody has a handheld dynamometer. Not everybody has a knee extension. So I feel like we need to do a better job of putting it all together. I talked about this in a blog post from Mike's website. If you do want to check it out, um, it's not the conventional return to play testing that is out there and it needs work because what we're doing now needs a ton of work. So why does all of this matter? Uh, the rates are out of control, right? So you can see, especially the females, uh, football players, highest rate of recurrent ACL ruptures in NCAA. Um, this was a 2018 paper in Orthopedic Journal of Sports Medicine. What are some of the tests that are out there? You can use isokinetic testing. To me, that's almost the gold standard, right? Uh, could be controversial to say that, but I think if you can use uh, something that's going to give you objective numbers, because I worry that the hop test, yes, um, Dr. Noyes developed these back in the day and Lynn talked about them. People can cheat, right? You can use a hip strategy and not and have a quad deficit, significant quad deficit, but still look like a stud on a hop test. You can't cheat on an isokinetic test. You can't cheat on how much torque you can produce in your quad and hamstring and how fast you can produce that torque, the rate of force development on an isokinetic test. Again, the problem is we don't have these biodex devices. We don't have uh, access to this 95% of the time. You'd need to go to a big organization, a big hospital or big research facility that many people don't have access to. So I struggle. So this is that uh, Grindstaff study I talked about, Hansen et al., the Terry friend of mine was on, and they looked at using handheld dynamometry um, for looking at at least some kind of quad torque, 
and um, you know, you, you just read these studies, but this is the way I am now at least trying to get some objective measurement of, uh, of, of the quad uh, after either prehab or I begin around three months out of surgery to begin to look at their quad and just to get a baseline of where we're at and how we compare to that prehab number if I can get it. We talked about rate of force development a second ago. Again, it's how fast can they get the quad to kick in um, uh, at, when they are instructed, right? So this is, again, a, a, a conscious test versus on the field, it's, it's, a sub, it's, it's not conscious, right? You were just running and cutting and, 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 and adjusting to the, to the field around you. So again, it gives us something, but again, not everybody has an isokinetic device. Here are the hop tests, Lynn talked about that. I don't use them, sorry. Here are some normalized values. Uh, in people uh, from this paper in IGSPT. I put this in there, my ACL talk, in case people use hop tests. Again, I'm sorry, I don't use hop tests. I'm, I'm admitting that uh, in front of, we're up to 893 people. We lost four people. We're 893 people, um, and I, I don't use hop tests. Um, RSI, again, RSI is valuable, in my opinion, uh, for people who appear fearful. Uh, my 15 year old, 16 year old athlete who is rehabbing. I don't use this. I'm sorry. Again, I think I'm, I feel like I'm in a, I'm just spilling the beans right now, but um, I don't use RSI. I don't use hot tests. Um, they, they're not valuable. Um, I've given RSIs to my high school kids and have them fill it out. And at like six months out of surgery, they think they're ready to go. And I just laugh at them because I know they're not ready to go, but they lie to me right on the test because they just want to play sports with their friends. So um, for me, it's all about strength right? I am monitoring their psychological uh, influence and how their rehab is going constantly. So if they don't feel confident in their leg, they probably are not going to do well in the rehab process. They're probably not going to present well when I have them squatting, deadlifting, running, jumping, uh, et cetera. So if they don't do well uh, psychologically on these tests, then they will have poor hop test symmetry and put poor subjective knee function. And it's associated with not returning back to their sports. So numerous studies I have shown that if I see somebody who I think is grossly fearful, even there, and I think that they're ready to go um, at, you know, at four months, six months, I may give them this test, uh, like this Tampa scale test for kinesiophobia. Uh, again, I've given this test. I've tried, I've tried, I've tried, um, but everybody, in my opinion, lies on it. Unless they truly are fearful and they want to tell me that they're fearful, then they're going to put it down. But the people that I treat do not want to tell me that they are fearful. But I can, I can pick it up. I can pick it up. So I like to, once I get them through a strengthening phase, so that three months, four months, five months, I am doing a ton of squats, deadlifts, uh, lunges, single leg uh, squats, I'm core stuff, I'm working on everything, right? And then I wanted them to start running, in my opinion, at five months out of surgery. So I said, people like to start running at three months, I delay until five months, because between three and five months, I'm working on strength, and I'm beginning to add power, I'm beginning to add um, basic jumping, perturbations, jogging, things of that nature. Um, one-legged jumps. This is my kind of my progression in my head to get people to be ready um, to maybe begin running. I don't have an anti-gravity treadmill. I don't have a pool, but I think people do the best and feel the best when they start running four to five months out of surgery. Okay. That's just my opinion. And then you can start looking at maybe force production, uh, torque production, um, and compare it to body weight. And this study um, uh, showed that uh, the study just came out, literally just came out in 2021, like, like hot off the press, that the cutoff, this is all ACL hamstring autographs, the cutoff value for quad strength to body weight for initiating jogging was 1.45 newton, uh, newton meters per kilogram. Uh, somebody should have about three newton meters per kilogram to be ready to get back to their sport. So three newton meters per kilogram. This was allowing them to get back at about half of that uh, total amount of torque that they can produce. So you need uh, a good amount of strength to get back to the sport, but I think you need more than you think to get back to uh, jogging. So what do we recommend? It's more complex than simply a test. There's so many different things to consider. I am, again, I'm not a fan of, all right, it's six months out, it's time to test. To me, the test is going on daily, weekly, monthly, minute by minute. That's how I treat my athletes and I am constantly pushing them 
because I want to see, are they hitting the check boxes? Can they squat one to one and a half percent of their body weight? Can they oh, deadlift one to one percent of their body weight for male or female? Can they uh, squat, you know, uh, 0.5 to 1% of their body weight to be able to get back to running or something like that. So I'm using them as my test. And, but I do like Lynn's talk that does mention nine months. To me, nine months is the cutoff. That's when, that's when I'm uh, telling my patients and their families that that's our goal. That's our ultimate goal is nine months out of surgery. So let's now count backwards. Let's figure out uh, what we need to do to get there. And let's, we're going to have some bumps in the road, but we will get there. So it's not an exact science. Uh, I am not, uh, not uh, anti-hop test. I just think there's better ways to do it. I think we'll, we'll talk about this in the breakout session. So we just need to get better. We need to get better at end stage rehab and get people's uh, knees to calm down, stay calm down and get them as strong as possible. You can find me on social media if you need me, uh, but thank you, Stan. Thank you everyone for having me and I'll look forward to the panel discussion uh, very soon. Thanks again. Thanks, Lenny. I, uh, I hate it when you hold back your opinion. Uh, just, it's terrible. terrible. <laughs> uh, it's gonna be a good okay. one. <laughs> okay, all right. Uh, our next our next speaker is Holly Silvers Grinelli. Um, uh, she's pretty well known in the research of a lot in uh, different sports, but uh, soccer is one of her bigger ones. Um, she's done some excellent work uh, with Major League Baseball on hamstring provision. She's been on this these episodes before uh, on the hamstrings. Um, she um, uh, her education is Rutgers at uh, bachelor's Western University. Uh, in physical therapy in University of Delaware uh, with her buddy Lynn um, uh, for her PhD. So um, she is a re rehabilitation consultant for Major League uh, Soccer uh, and uh, um, the Los Angeles Galaxy. Uh, she reviews over 20 scientific journals. Uh, I'm going fast because I want, I want her to talk more than me. Uh, she is the owner of Velocity Physical Therapy in Los Angeles. I'm not sure where, where it is. Santa Monica. Santa Monica, I'm sorry. Um, and she's married to her husband, Dennis, and a proud mother of two wonderful children. Um, so we'll let you take it off. Thanks, Holly. All right. Uh huh. Just share my screen here. Great. Thank you, Stan. Uh, and so great. This is such a great conversation. And uh, so proud to be included with Lynn and she was my PhD uh, advisor. So I'm a proud blue hen as well. And great to hear Lenny's talk as well. So we're gonna actually go in reverse here. We're gonna talk about how do we actually prevent these injuries from occurring in the first place. And I don't know if this is sort of sad or um, just earnestly, we've been at this for, I've been working in the field of ACL injury prevention for over two decades. And unfortunately, despite our efforts, these numbers continue to rise. So we're gonna talk about why that is. Um, I am a consultant, I'm the research chair for Major League Soccer, so that's my only disclosure. So we know soccer is the most widely played sport amongst uh, men and women. And in the United States, it's actually the third most popular sport, interestingly. Um, we have about uh, 800,000 players at the high school level, about 60,000 players at the collegiate level. However, soccer injuries seem to plague us. They're not uncommon. It depends on age, level of play, player position, field type, and timing of injury, plus uh, sex or gender. Um, this is just a schematic looking at overall ACL tear rate in children under the age of 18 in the United States. So this data went over a 20 year period. And what's unfortunate about that, you can see the trend is up, you know, both females shown in blue and males shown in red. We see this consistent trend up and this is a rate per 100,000 participating uh, children under the age of 18. If we look specifically at high school aged athletes, unfortunately, there are about 187 thousand injuries that occur in soccer in the United States under the age of 18, 43,000 of which are ACL specific. Um, it's kind of shocking when you think about that. A quarter of the injuries that we're seeing in this age group are ACL injuries. And we, if we look specifically at high school injury rates, no, the number one uh, in terms of incidence rate is girls soccer. There are, the incidence rate is 11.7. Boys soccer is the third most uh, prolific sport with respect to ACL injuries in males. So girls soccer number one, boys soccer number three. 
if we look at NCAA data, there's been some great work published by Liza Arendt and uh, Randy Dick and looking over um, the NCAA surveillance databases. And basically the trends are very similar to what we see in the high school aged athlete, that the, uh, the data is, when we look at men versus women, there's about a three fold discrepancy in female injury rate versus male and with women, unfortunately, leading the charge there. Um, a, Rob Bo Brophy published a paper looking at this collective group and to follow them out longitudinally. And unfortunately, within seven years after an, incurring an ACL injury at the collegiate level, 65% of the players are no longer playing sport. They've selected themselves out either fear or lack of opportunity. There's a number of reasons there, but it's an interesting phenomenon that we see continue on in the professional cohorts, which we'll talk about in just a few slides. So this is a 2015 picture of our women's national team. And what is stunning about this photo is that 64% of the starting 11 have had at least one ACL tear. It's shocking. So when I started working with Bert Mandelbaum back in 1999, we were contacted by uh, one of the U20 women's coaches. And of the player pool of 40 individuals, they had 26 ACL injuries, um, a history of. And you're thinking, my God, if we're thinking about 10 years down the road where we've got radiographic changes, uh, an OA being demonstrated, you know, these, these young women are not even 30 years old and we're seeing radiographic changes. So I'm like, we have to do something. Like what, do, what can we do to intervene uh, prospectively to help mitigate risk? Well, I mean, our ultimate goal is prevention. I don't know if that's realistic, but certainly mitigate risk. So this was a nice paper published by, um, out of Europe, uh, Marcus Walden and Martin Hogland, looking at ACL injuries at the men's professional level. So this is within soccer. And they did a 15-year prospective study, and they followed 78 teams over 15 seasons. And they found that the game injury rate superseded practice injury rate. It's exactly what we see here in the States. Game injury rate is... Um, upwards of 20 times that of practice. Um, the re initial return to play rate for this specific group was 97%. Um, however, 7% of those individuals were re-injured during training and never made it to a, back to a game. And then only after three years after injury, uh, only 65% of the players were still playing. So similar to that Rob Brophy paper that we, we discussed in just a minute. Um, I had the pleasure of collaborating with Amy Arndell. She's one of my PhD colleagues um, under Lynn as well. And we did a study looking at major league soccer, looking both at performance and career length after ACL injuries. So we looked at 71 ACL injuries that occurred over three seasons. And what we found that not only were their career lengths impacted, their career uh, length, for the intervention, or I'm sorry, the ACL group was about 1.4 years after injury compared to a control group, which was 2.5 years. So they had a significant reduction in their overall career length. What was interesting is that the ACL group started less and were subbed less. So most of the ACL group was unused, 45% of them, if they made, if they were able to suit up and actually make the game roster, um, they were unused compared to 31% in the uninjured group. So there's either a performance component here, is that a psychological component in terms of uh, not feeling confident in their newly con reconstructed knee in order to play at the level they were playing with before? Um, it has their performance decreased, so the coaches wasn't selecting them. And then ultimately, were their career lengths being impacted because of that lack of performance? So it's really a massive issue um, that needs to be prevented or mitigated in the first place. So we're going to talk, the, the theme of this particular talk, we're going to talk about four steps to reduce overall injury. We're going to start with mechanism of injury. So we need to identify prior risk factors, and we can do that by analyzing video. If you're dealing at the professional, the collegiate le level, oftentimes, even high school, you'll have video perhaps of them playing prior, which I always recommend um, when I'm working with an ACL reconstruction to try to get video of them moving prior to the injury so we have a sense of what they look like and to look at the contralateral lower extremity in terms of strength and biomechanics because we can glean some clues from there as well. So there were three video analysis studies uh, looking at mechanism of ACL injury, one of which I was part of with Rob Brophy, and we looked at um, ACL injuries occurring at the professional and collegiate level, and we found that 
when we analyzed the mechanism, 73% of the time, these players were playing some defensive role. So not a defender per se, but they were defending. 51% uh, of the time they were tackling and 15% cutting. So they had this hip and knee, they were very upright, right? Hip and knee extension, trying to anticipate what their other, with the opposing player, the offensive player is about to do, trying to read the play. So there's a lot of cortical uh, excitability happening here. Um, oftentimes we would see some knee valgus, foot would be planted, and it's this unanticipated event because they're trying to predict what the other player is about to do. Uh, there was another paper published by Marcus Walden's group is very, found very similar findings to what we found. 44% of the time there was a defensive uh, nature to the actual ACL mechanism, 20% came after landing, after heading, and 24% of theirs were direct contact, um, which follows the trend for what we see here in the States where about 70 to 75% of ACL injuries overall are non-contact in nature. A most recent study that was published uh, by the De La Via group looking at another systematic video analysis of ACL injuries in soccer, um, they interestingly found indirect contact was similar to non-contact. And when they deemed indirect contact, that didn't mean direct contact to the knee. That could have been another body part, like the trunk. So there was some sort of perturbation. And that, I know Lenny brought this up as well as Lynn, it's really important to build in perturbation during rehab so that you can mitigate this risk going forward. Um, and they found that ACL injuries were prevalent more in the first half. And one of the more controversial things we've been discussing in the recent past, oops, excuse me, I, my light's on a timer here in my office went off, um, is that fatigue uh, was thought to be a potential risk factor. Is fatigue a factor from neuromuscular um, deficits in terms of ACL risk? And that's been largely you know, interestingly, a little counterintuitively to be no, that, you know, we do see ACL injuries that aren't necessarily happening late in the game with fatigue, um, but we can have this discussion about central and peripheral fatigue, which we will discuss later on in the talk. So um, I took the video out because as Lenny said, Zoom videos don't work very well, but this is Stuart Holden, one of our national team players. And this is just take this screenshot is about a nanosecond before he's about to tear his, um, his left ACL, his, I'm sorry, it's his right ACL. So he, he was just coming back from a left knee injury where he had a uh, contact uh, medial patellar dislocation where he dislocated the bottom of his uh, left medial femoral condyle. This was his first competitive national team back. Look how upright he's it, he is. So when he takes that step with his right foot, and he's defending. Quintero had uh, possession of the ball, was clearing it around him. He's trying to change direction to read Quintero's play and subsequently, unfortunately, tears his ACL. And um, interesting, so we can say there's a number of variables at play here. Was he, uh, was there any fear or confidence issues here? Was he still guarding on that left side because of the injury that he's coming back from and look at his upright positioning he's very upright so very minimal to little knee and hip flexion at that moment in time so the next step when we think about mitigating injury is the surgical and rehabilitation process the intervention and the prevention components so i think we're going to discuss this a bit later but the um the graft selection issue, and that's a bit of a hot topic. What graft do you choose? Is it hamstring? Is it bone patellar tendon bone? Is it quad? Quad tendon is getting really popular here on the West Coast. Um, do you use a hamstring on a female? Do you use an allograft on a younger individual? Um, these are all great questions and definitely have some firm opinions about that. <laughs> but um, we want to integrate the proper rehab and adequate loading at the right time. So using handheld dynamometry, I also use Surface EMG to make sure um, my handheld dy not dynamometry results are being corroborated, what's happening neurally too. So what's great about all of these uh, devices, which used to be a little bit cost prohibitive for private practices in the past, they are not any longer. I use an M-trigger device. Um, for surface EMG, and I use a handheld baseline dynamometer. And um, I think it's, it, again, not as great as the Biodex, but in terms of having some objective data and you're measuring apples to apples within the same athlete, I think it can work quite well. Here we go. 
Whoops. Okay, so we know there are many, many ACL injuries programs that have been scientifically vetted in, in the recent past, and that includes, a, and I'm, there are a couple more that are, I don't even have listed here, but from the Harmony program, Greta Mikkelbest's work um, in t handball in um, Norway, um, the PEP program, which I was uh, fortunate to be one of the developers of, the 11 Plus program, which I also helped develop, the 11 Plus for Kids, uh, Cincinnati Sports Metric program, which we'll discuss in just a minute. But the cool thing is about all of these prevention programs, and we see the graph in the middle of the screen, they're all effective. They all work in some capacity. So pick whichever one you, you like. You don't necessarily have it to have an allegiance to one, but we really mitigate risk from anywhere from the low end of 60% upwards of 89%. Um, and we're gonna just talk about a few programs, but the one program um, I was very inspired by earlier on in my career was the sports metric program for Frank Noyes and Tim Hewitt. That was a three-part program you're probably all familiar with, um, included stretching plyometrics, and it was a pre-season-based program that was done over six weeks. So they had wonderful results as a result of utilizing uh, this particular program with decreases in peak landing forces, uh, really beneficial uh, biomechanical changes at the knee um, for varus and valgus movements, and they saw increased hamstring strength. I'd say that one of the shortcomings, so they had a 60% overall decrease in ACL injuries, and this was across three sports, but this was a preseason program, so they didn't utilize it in season. So is there a risk of recidivism here? Would you see poor or pathokinematic program uh, biomechanics return through the course of the season because you're no longer utilizing us throughout the course of the season. And this program was quite long in length. It was over an hour to complete. So the length of the program could potentially impact overall compliance. So uh, we started in I think in 2000, we developed the PEP program here in Santa Monica. And this was an on the field alternative warm up program that was basically designed to be uh, to basically sub in for your existing uh, dynamic warm up program. So we wanted to keep it short and sweet, cost effective. So we didn't, there was no other additional equipment necessary. You just needed a field and a ball. And it, from a time efficiency perspective, it was designed to just sub in as your warm up. So in terms of compliance, we wanted to make sure there was no cost and make sure it's a warm up so that way perhaps we would get higher compliance and higher adherence to the program. So we ran this in the Coast Soccer League here in Southern California uh, with female athletes between the ages of 14 to 18. In the first year of the study, we had an 88% reduction in non-contact ACL injury. And I'll be totally honest with you, we were so shocked that we actually replicated the study for the second year because we were kind of stunned with our results and we found very similar findings in the second year. It was a 74% reduction. So the following year, we were uh, collaborated with the Centers for Disease Control. We used the very same program at the Division I level in the NCAA, and this was women's soccer. We had 61 teams involved, and we basically had identical results to what we found in that high school age cohort. So we had uh, a 72% overall, if we're going to move um, from the bottom of the screen to the top here, we had a 72% overall reduction in game and practice ACL injury. We had a 100% reduction in practice in ACL. So there were no injuries that occurred in practice. There was a 100% reduction in injuries that happened late in the season. So as you're well aware, the NCAA season is a little bit short. So when we think about neuromuscular interventions and how much time it takes to impart the benefit, from a biomechanical perspective, that takes about four to six weeks. So we wanted to look at late in season. We had no ACLs in games and or practices late in the season. And those individuals, the, this last group on top of the graph here, that had sustained an ACL earlier on in their career, whether that be high school or earlier on in their collegiate career, we only had one reoccurrence and it was a contact ACL. So a 100% reduction of um, contact, non-contact ACL and an 80% reduction in contact ACL. So overall great results. So numerous attempts we know have been made to decrease sports related injury and as we're discussing ACL injury. Um, however, the thought was, well, there are other deleterious injuries that remain um, to the hip, to the foot and ankle, and how could we maybe collectively go about maybe developing an intervention to address all soccer related injury? 
So we teamed up as a group in Oslo back in 2005, and there were a group of us that developed the 11 plus program. And the goals were very similar to what we had in the PEP program and sports metric and the Harmony, all these other prevention programs, with the exception of we were trying to build a more looking at this at a more macro scale, if you will, trying to involve hip injury prevention and knee and ankle, uh, foot and ankle, as well as the knee, which we've been so ultimately focused on for obvious reasons. So this study was first tested in Norway, uh, between females between the ages of 13 to 17, another large cohort study. And there were a 32, we had a 32% reduction in all injury and a 53% reduction in overuse injury and 45% in severe injury. So even with the injury mitigation that we saw in this particular group, there was actually, when we looked at the injuries, the injuries overall were not only fewer in number, but they were less severe. That was a really important finding. So part of my dissertation um, under the tutelage of Lynn um, was to look at the efficacy of the 11 plus in males, because we didn't have male data at this point in time. So much of ACL injury prevention research up until this time was done in the done in females. So we wanted to see, does this program work in the male cohort? So we had, uh, we did a large randomized control trial at the NCAA level, at the division one and division two level. We had 61 teams that agreed to participate. And we had very similar findings to what we saw, actually a little bit even slightly better than what we saw in the Norwegian group. We had an overall reduction of 46.2% with overall injury rate a 32% reduction in time loss. So again, like what the Norwegians found, not only were people getting injured less, they were getting injured less severely, which is again, very important. And what's, what I think was fascinating, one of the interesting data points we found is that there were a significantly higher number of days missed in the control group. So again, the severity of injury was much lower in the inventor, intervention group. So we had an odds ratio of 1.4, meaning every day that was missed in the intervention group, 1.4 days was missed in the control group. So those individuals that were not utilizing the 11 plus program. Um, and this to me is one of the most fascinating slides I think I, I have in my whole talk. The day that the 11 plus this, so this data is only for the intervention group. So those individuals using the 11 plus program as their warm up. So the day that they used the 11 plus, the injury rate was nearly 40% lower on, as opposed to the days that they did not use it. They either used a different warm up or, you know, passed up on the warm up altogether. Who knows? But we had, it's, and it's fascinating because it really, um, and there's an implication here that something really dynamic is happening from a neural perspective. And there may be some transient nature to this, but it's immediate. And I think this is a really powerful slide that the day this program was utilized, that the injury rate was even lower than the overall decreased rate that we were seeing throughout the course of the season. So really fascinating. So these are other studies that utilize the 11 plus program. And again, everybody compellingly has found de decreased injury rates by virtue of using the program. And um, uh, Christian Torberg published a really nice meta-analysis. And the mean, if we look at all of these programs using the 11 plus, there was about a 53.2% reduction. So this program really works. And this is overall injury rate. The um, question remains, because to my knowledge, uh, no one was really stratifying and looking at ACL injuries specifically with respect to the 11 plus. So we did that with our data. We looked out of all those division one men, division one and division two men's players, does the 11 plus program decrease the rate of ACL injury? So specific to ACLs. And we found, yes, really compellingly, actually, we had a significant decrease in total ACL injury rate by 76%. And what, um, what was interesting, we did not find a statistical difference in contact ACL injury. It did not reach statistical significance, but we did have it in non-contact ACL injuries. So the problem with the work is, <laughs> I always laugh because I think, gosh, with all of this compelling data, what coach, what player would not want to use this? It sounds so exciting to us. Why is compliance such a challenge? Why do we suffer uh, with uh, adherence to these programs. Why do coaches choose not to use them? So we know that injuries in sport are an important public health problem. And uh, although we have scientifically vetted all of these programs and they've been shown statistically to decrease injury rate, translating an uh, injury prevention program into practice has been very difficult. And then why is that? Um, 
obviously we can think about cost, we can think about timing, can we make them more time efficient? And I think that was one of our massive goals with the PEP program and the 11 plus program in particular, making it short and sweet, it dubs in as your dynamic warm up. we're not taking any additional time away, doesn't entail any additional equipment. Um, but still, even with those things in place, uh, we struggle. So we have to think about how do we scale up? How do we get adoption and fidelity and compliance and adherence all to improve? Well, one of the one of the ways to do this, there was a recent study published by Matt Whalen, re interestingly, very recently, it was like, hey, what if we make this program even a little bit shorter? What if we take, so um, the way the 11 plus is structured, you have the running component, it's part one, part two strength, and part three is a little bit more dynamic, biomechanical and agility based. So what if you took the strength part and you put it to the back, put it to the back after training? And they found that by doing so, they maintained efficacy. So there was really no change in, um, in fact, you had increased player compliance and the number of severe injuries slightly decreased. However, I think when you read this paper critically, I think it's difficult to say that we can't, the program was more effective when you move part two, as the doses within the control group and the intervention group were a little different. So the intervention group, the ones that used part two at the end, they did 29.1 doses over the course of the season versus the control group that was using the 11 plus as prescribed, they only, they did it about a third less. So when they, when these authors made the suggestion that, oh, by doing part two at the end, um, the compliance was perhaps a little bit more, I'm sorry, the uh, decrease in severe injuries was less. And that may have um, been nestled into the fact that the overall dose level was a bit lower. So that might be a little bit of a confounding variable, but overall good news in terms of, hey, if you're short on time, you can move part two to the back. My thought is as a clinician and as a former player and uh, is like, by moving part two to the back, will it ever get done? No, I wonder about the compliance and the adherence overall to getting that strength component in. So we know injury prevention programs work. However, what biomechanical, biomechanical changes are we making? What are we actually doing to impart a protective benefit? And my, this was another part of my dissertation because my thought was, okay, a lot of people have been successful in the last 20 years putting together these programs. But if we can identify what we're actually changing, we could do a couple of things. One, we can make these programs even better, and then we can bring that knowledge into the clinic and make sure we're integrating that into all our uh, rehab um, and, and actually prevention efforts to make sure that all of our athletes that have sustained a primary injury do not sustain a secondary injury. So kind of exciting stuff. So we're back to stage, we're on step three. So the biomechanical strength and functional analysis. So we can look at movement analysis, so whether that's 2D, if you're lucky enough to have access to a 3D motion analysis lab, fantastic. Um, but to look for readiness to return to play and to look at strength testing and surface EMG for asymmetries. So we looked at, um, this was developed by Chris Powers out of Motion Power, uh, Motion Performance Institute here in Los Angeles, but we looked at these six movements within um, both female and male collegiate athletes, and this was done at the University of Delaware, and we utilized the lab to look at these movements over the course of a season. So we did a pre-test and a post-season season test to look at what is the 11 plus, so these athletes were utilizing the 11 plus program, and we compared them to a control group that were using their standard warm-up, they were not using the 11 plus, just to see what are we actually changing to get these really effective uh, injury reduction and injury risk mitigation numbers um, that we've been seeing statistically. So we utilized the single leg squat and you'll see here, I'll play two videos. So on the bottom of the screen, you can see this is an athlete who's struggling. We see a lot of valgus varus perturbation there, a little bit of Trendelenburg, her control is not perfect. And if we look at the top, we can see a better uh, performance of this particular exercise. So the uh, She's got better control. She's not getting as deep as we would like, but she's really mitigating that valgus varus perturbation there. Uh, one of the other tests we looked at was a triple hop. So doing a three combined triple hop, and you can see the athlete on the bottom of the screen. We see some valgus um, upon landing onto the horse plate. She's got some poor hip and uh, pelvic control. Athlete on the top of the screen, definitely better uh, performance with respect to mitigating valgus varus perturbation at the knee and definitely better core trunk and um, hip control. 
Um, the other things we looked at, we looked at deceleration, single limb deceleration and drop vertical jumps to look at not only impulse, uh, we're looking at um, kinematics at multiple joints, the foot and ankle, knee and hip, um, and then analyzing this data to see what are we changing from a kinematic perspective during these movements to uh, realize this drop in injury rate overall. So we found some interesting trends. So on the single leg squat, the intervention group, so those, util those utilizing the 11 plus are shown in red. The red lines depict those particular athletes. The control group is blue. So we saw some increases in hip flexion angle, which is a which is sort of a positive. You know, we want to see deeper hip flexion angles for single leg squats and knee for that matter. We saw changes in the hip moment, um, which were positive in terms of hip flexion moment. Again, um, the with the control group trending the exact opposite direction with going toward extension. With hip internal rotation, interestingly, our intervention group started the preseason, the pretest values were higher. So actually our control group was actually um, from a biomechanical perspective presenting um, a little bit more favorably, if you will, from a hip internal rotation perspective, but we, bo we saw decreases on both sides. And then the knee flexion angle, we saw increases in knee flexion angle within the intervention group and we saw decreases in knee flexion angle um, in the single leg squat for the intervention group. I'm sorry, the control group. So again, we want to see increases in knee, hip and knee flexion. Triple hop, very similar statistics. We saw, um, again, hip flexion angles, not really making any statistical change. In fact, we didn't see any statistical changes. Any, everything with the asterisks was statistically significant. Um, the frontal plane hip movement, again, um, we had some stability in the intervention group. We saw decreases in the control group. Hip internal rotation angle, very similar to what we saw with the single leg squat. Um, our control group was presented more favorably from the beginning um, and then we saw downward trends for both groups so we can we certainly couldn't ac um, account this for the 11 plus per se but the knee flexion moment we also we saw some favorable changes within the intervention group with the uh, control group showing decreases which again we want to see increases in knee and hip flexion um, Amy Arundel one of my colleagues at uh, UDEL she's currently with the Brooklyn Next but she published this and we were collaborative on this particular paper, but looking at injury risk factors over two collegiate seasons for drop vertical jump. And that she found that the control and intervention group showed increases in peak knee abduction over the first season. Um, but the control group, similar to what I found in those other two tasks we just discussed, that there was a decrease in knee flexion angle. We know that to be problematic. Um, that was within the control group. So those individuals that were not utilizing the 11 plus. So Amy, uh, like similar to what I found is that the benefits of the 11 plus may be more directly related to the hip. Is this program suited well enough to make the biomechanical changes at the knee or, or are the protective benefits at the hip enough? Really good question. Um, there's a nice study published by Julie Thompson Kohlsler and looking at when can we introduce the 11 plus effectively, and does that make a difference? So they looked at two cohorts, a young group between the ages of 10 to, uh, 10 to 12, and then an older between the ages of 14 to 18. And what they found, they got improvements amongst both groups using the uh, 11 plus program, but the 10 to 12 year olds um, realized more benefit from doing the program. So this evidence supports that perhaps introducing these interventions earlier on in development may be more beneficial. And why is that? Is that because these pathokinematic or poor movement patterns, if you will, aren't as well entrenched from a cognitive perspective, a cortical control perspective. Um, we're kind of breaking a bad habit before it's well established, if you will. Um, or we can have the benefit of intervening before these cortical patterns are, neuromuscular patterns are too entrenched um, from a motor learning perspective. So just the interpretation of all the biomechanics, we know the 11 plus that had a heavy emphasis on core and trunk and proximal control. All of our analyses has showed that the major delta that we saw, so the changes are occurring at the hip, mainly in the single wing test. So does this program do enough? Does it initiate enough of a kinetic and kinematic change at the knee? And do younger athletes benefit more than older adults? So these questions we're, we're beginning to understand a little bit more um, sort of robustly, if you will. But I think some of the answers are yes. I think younger athletes, the earlier we intervene, the better. So on our last step, it's the cortical control and the athlete readiness to return to play. So please don't forget the brain. The brain is so such an incredible part to what 
we need to continue to understand here. I had the pleasure, um, another one of my colleagues at UDL was Ryan Zarzicki, his work in Dustin Grooms and Merida Shapat, they're doing phenomenal work in this world in terms of understanding the role of the cortex. Um, alterations to sensory feedback uh, could potentially underlie the rise in ex uh, cortical excitability that we see in the ACL injured population. So there's this preoccupation if you will, preoccupation of the brain with the injured side that when put in a situation where you have to interpret other environmental concerns, with these athletes that are at a big uh, deficit, they can't potentially or possibly interpret all of the information that's around them because so much of their RAM, if you will, their cortical availability is being uh, utilized by the injured lower extremity. So we see these delays in corticospinal and interneuron efferent outputs. We know that. So there's delays in uh, contraction time and delays in sequencing. So this preoccupation may persist upwards of the 18 to 24 months. And I think that's where um, some of the literature coming out, Tim Hewitt published something recently looking at, oh, well, should we be holding out players two years? I think that may be on the long side. I think we can have athletes work in. I agree with Lenny and Lynn. Um, nine to 12 month mark is what I'm counseling people. I Oddly, I think COVID has been the best thing ever for ACL rehab <laughs> because I can keep my players out even longer. And it's been a wonderful thing. So I'm like, every day you're out from that surgical intervention, it's a day safer. So uh, we discussed the four steps to reduce injury and mitigate risk. And just from a future directions perspective, we want to determine if significant injury risks could be detected. So this has been controversial as well. Can we profile high risk movement? Can it be predictive? And that's been an interesting controversial subject. I think we can to some extent, but we're not quite there yet in terms of um, the intensity in terms of the specificity and the sensitivity of these testings. So I think we have to continue to work hard at that. Um, does the screening tools that we're currently using have the intended specificity? No, categorically no. And I think we need to work on that from a return to play perspective. Um, so return to play can be similar to identification of high risk injury uh, movement patterns. Uh, we want to continue to address the issue of compliance and program fidelity. We want to make sure that the efforts that we put into developing these programs, we want to make sure people are using them. Reap the benefit of the science. So make them attractive, make them, give them some performance benefit as well. And refine the injury prevention protocols as we continue to learn more. Uh, can we move part two to the end? Can we introduce this in the younger age group? I think all of these new studies that are coming out continue to give us more information making these in programs more impactful and potentially mitigating and reducing risk as we go forward. So thank you very much. Really appreciate your time and look forward um, as a group to take questions with Lynn and Lenny. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Very good, Holly. Uh, we're going to bring everybody back on <clears throat> to do the question and answers. We got some great questions from the audience. Um, if you um, uh, enjoy evidence-based practices and knowing how to do that. This has been a great uh, series of lectures. Um, <clears throat> I know there's a lot of uh, other programs out there uh, and uh, uh, we've all, uh, the, the, the presenters and, and myself have been on some of those where they give you four minutes to present <laughs> um, or seven minutes or something like that. <clears throat> what we like to do here is to get, get in some in depth and this is some serious in depth thing. Um, on Holly's uh, talk, uh, you know, uh, injury prevention uh, is boring. Performance enhancement, however, is really good, which is exactly the same thing. Uh, so uh, we've found in baseball that it is, uh, we don't call it injury prevention. I think that your, your term uh, risk mitigation is better, but performance uh, people want, and they don't know it's a prevention program. Um, <clears throat> Nancy, why don't you grab, we just have just a ton of questions, which is, which is great. Um, kind of go through some of them and, and we'll talk and the speakers have agreed to, to stick around, even though we're going to go over time. Uh, so people can stay on as long as they want. Mm -hmm. Nancy. All right. I believe this first one is for Lynn, but whoever feel free to jump in. Um, in the ACL reconstructive group, do you use ACL brace once they've reached full return to play? And if yes, how long do you ask them to use the brace? Okay, so <clears throat> I tried. To... The answer is, so we just let the doctors choose. 
Um, there is no evidence that bracing helps with prevention of second injury, except in downhill skiing. There's really good evidence for that. So we recommend that our downhill skiers wear. We do not otherwise, and mm. our Norwegian colleagues never use it. And we have the exact same results. So, um, but if their surgeon recommends it, you know, it's really between them and their surgeon and it, it's, they're the ones who are justifying the cost. But the data are incredibly strong that other than downhill skiing, it doesn't make a difference post-op. Lenny, Lenny, what do you got on that? Um, brace, I, no brace. I get this yeah, I get this question a lot. Um, it depends. Um, I grew up, like I said, in Birmingham. We braced everybody. Um, I think Lynn hit the nail on the head. Does it matter? I don't know. Um, that's part of my kind of psychological assessment. If I feel like they mentally need it, I will counsel them to, to get it because some doctors are going to give it to them and it is what it is. Mm -hmm. And I just, I, I, I smile and I go with it and I just say, perfect, let's go. And uh, I don't necessarily wear it though in the clinic when I'm training them because I don't want them to get used to not wearing it. Um, but if I, if they really, really, really psychologically need it, then yes, I, I will. I will do it, but my end goal is no more, maybe a year out of surgery or a year after getting back, maybe they wear it, something like that at the most, but try to get out of it. We, okay, we, we have a, a paper that we published a bunch of years ago where, because a lot of the docs around here recommend it, and so they wear them, and then we tested them all at a year, and they were better out of the brace than in, so we yeah, decided, yeah. you know, discharge it, di discontinue it at a year. If you're using um, it, okay. just know that um, you don't have to use it. That's all. You know, don't feel like you're doing something wrong if you're not bracing, bracing your patients. And you're probably not doing anything bad if you are. So it's just a lot more money. Yeah. Um, um, uh, in, re in regards to, to a lot of people are asking questions, about five or six people ask questions on um, graph uh, selection. Uh, Holly, why don't you take that one, you know, pros and cons of, of, of each one, and does it really make any difference? Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned earlier, or I think someone mentioned, uh, female athletes and no hamstrings. Uh, uh, what's the rationale behind that? Yeah, I think um, Lenny, Lenny, Lenny mentioned, but I actually Please, agree with that. Not yeah. us. <laughs> I know, Lenny, we disagree here a little we bit. We disagree. Um, I, um, Good. So my thought, this is my thought pattern in terms of, so here with the surgeon, surgical group that I work here in Los Angeles with Carl and Job and Santa Monica Orthopedic, I would say the primary graft choice for, for a primary injury is bone patellar tendon bone. That is shifting though. We are seeing so many, like the last five ACLs I've seen have been quad tendon. So that's becoming the, um, and I like that graft. I like, so what I love about bone patellar tendon bone is that, okay, central third, you've got a bony fragment on each side. When you're looking at fixation into the femoral and tibial tunnels, I love it because you're getting bone on bone fixation. So on the quad tendon, we're only getting one bony fragment, right? We're getting superior patella. The other side is soft tissue. Um, the hamstring side, although I think I've seen them harvested, they look fantastic. They're big, they're ripe. I think the surgeons like to harvest them too because they can get a nice semi T. Uh, gracilis bundle there. My, my um, hesitation is that, okay, it's an agonist of the ACL. It's a primary, um, it, it, what we think about the hamstrings in terms of what it does biomechanically, preventing uh, excessive internal rotation, perhaps anterior tibial translation. Now, does that matter? I think the data postoperatively is definitely all over the map. <laughs> you know, you'll see one study that says, oh, bone patellar tendon is more favorable. Oh, there's no uh, secondary risk to hamstring, you know. So I think um, I, what, what I counsel patients say, go to a surgeon who's comfortable with the graft choice they want to do. Don't talk them out of a, <laughs> of a graft. You know, you want to go to a surgeon who's comfortable in that regard. I just personally would prefer an anterior graft. I personally have not mm. had trouble with anterior knee pain post-op, I feel like if we're managing what we need to do from the fusion perspective and we're loading properly, we're not going to have anterior knee pain, but that comes down to good PT, uh, potentially good, um, good patient education. And um, I know Lynn and I disagree in this regard, and I'd love to hear both of your thoughts. <laughs> Lenny, go, go, go after it, Lenny. 
Uh, you mean me, 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 Lenny. Lynn or Lenny? Lenny. Here we, we go. decided Lenny, Lenny <laughs> not Lenny. <laughs> Lenny. <laughs> not, not Lynn, Lenny. Lenny. No, I, I agree with I agree with Holly. Um, um, I and I guess I did mention I, I let the cat out of the bag about the female thing. I just don't like hamstrings in general for that younger population that uh, fifteen to you know twenty twenty five year old. I'm a I'm a patella tendon guy, autographed. Um, I'm an anti-allograft unless they're like 50, 45, 40, 50, something like that. Um, but I'm a definitely a patella tendon autograft, uh, probably secondary quad tendon autograft, and then a hamstring. But uh, I think like Holly said, um, one of our dynamic stabilizers of the knee is the hamstrings. And if you look at uh, the effect on strength, you're taking a tendon out or two tendons out. How is that going to affect the ability of the hamstrings to 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 come back to baseline and i think that's they grow back. significantly limited they grow back hmm? they grow back uh, kind of like you get like a <laughs> remnant of the tendon they, no they live your tail all the way back to the tibia if you don't if you don't do i have not, I've not heard that yeah no they're they, they, I, no you they, they yeah, do go back. The research does say that yeah 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 they no, I, tail, I agree. If, you, if you is don't it as effective as as the, yes. as the native tendon well, it, it, on MRI, be, between like at a year, two years, seven years, five, it, they they look like normal tendon. Once they reattach, you can get in trouble though by by doing resisted hamstrings too early in these pe folks. And actually, now yeah, that I we're that. now that we're we're delaying uh, return to play, like as long as you don't get too aggressive, they re re they generally reattach to the tibia by six months. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, I, don't, I don't think we should get into this argument except for allograft. Um, because I, I, think, I think we're all saying kind of the same thing. There are yeah. problems with every single one of them. Holly, you just like said, oh, quad tendon has bone on one side. Not with a lot of people. For many yeah. people are using it as a free graft. And it's rectus. You can get the strength yeah. back, but they almost always have a lag because no, I, you, I agree. The, if you, don't, if you don't sheet them back into hip extension, yeah, um, that rectus is a tendon injury. And but, no, I, to I totally agree. And the, so, the neurogenic like, inhibition early on in these quad tendons is magnificent. Like it's a real thing. So it's, um, my favorite is BPTB, to be honest. And um, that's yeah, sort of, yeah, you know, yeah. quad tendon is probably my least favorite. Yeah. Um, but I like, I mean, I think hamstring, and again, I, I do a lot, You so do you. In, in Europe, you go to Scandinavia, there's almost mm -hmm. everything's yeah. a hamstring. Mm -hmm. Right. Right. And right. they have fab, you know, they have the same outcomes that same we have. Same data. Yeah. So I don't yeah. think oh. as PTs, oh. let's just mm -hmm. put it this way. Um, as physical therapists, we should stay out of this argument, except yeah. <laughs> for how easy or hard they are to rehab, because we have almost no impact on, mm -hmm. and, and besides which, for most of our, the people that we're talking to today, you got to deal with everybody who walks into your clinic. Mm -hmm. So having an argument about, mm -hmm. wow, you had a crappy graft. No, mm -hmm. you should be able to, take, <laughs> to deal with what the pluses and minuses are of every single one of these grafts. Let the surgeons fight this out. We mm -hmm. should be talking about how to best rehab allograft, hamstring, quad tendon, bone yeah. pathology. Well, and, wait a minute now. Let's just let's back up for a second. I know, I know this is a, a, a episode in and of itself, uh, ex, except for uh, the the question really gets, and I don't know the the science on this. What is there a difference in return to play based on the on the graft? Uh, yeah. Like in 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 UCLs, there's there's really no difference. So is there a difference in return to play? Because that does affect physical therapists. And, and a lot of times we see the patient before the doctor does, and, and there are recommendations we give. So uh, what Allograft. is the return to play? Allograft in a young person, you better hold them out for, I mean, that's the one thing I think we all agree on, right? And mm -hmm. so does the literature. You shouldn't be putting an allograft in a young person. So there's no, difference, there's no difference between hamstring and patellar tendon bone um in outcomes in, in this, in, 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 there's is a, there any difference if if they're well rehabilitated i mean the the we had a no, paper no, no. That we, no, i'm not trying to i'm trying not to get specific i'm talking general it takes about in, four in honest to god with really really good rehab 
It yep. takes a little bit more to get them to a quiet, you know, post-op to a quiet knee. For, hamstrings are easier to rehab, but you got to hold them back, right? You have, you can't, you still can't let them go back early. You let them go back early, they're ready earlier, right? If you measure if you, by, by every stretch. But if you let them go back earlier, they're going to tear, right? Okay, let's let, let's let's move because I, I know that the, a lot of people are, have asked different questions here. Uh, Nancy, th throw another one out there. All right, for Lenny, some, Lenny. some, some yeah. red meat out here for this group. <laughs> for Lenny, you mentioned in your slide about rehab at six to twelve weeks that you still like to protect yeah. the graft. What activities yeah. do you avoid, and what activities that strain the graft uh, would you avoid that someone else might incorporate? Uh, I, I think it's more protecting the person from themselves. So I'm still letting them know, like, you are still vulnerable. This is the graft is trying to ligamentize, right? It's, it's a tendon turning into a ligament. You, so they start to feel too good, right? They start talking about jogging and they start talking about like they're messing around with their friends and the braces off. So now people don't realize they hurt. So I want to protect them from themselves uh, for those first, you know, the, the first few weeks is easy. They're hurting, they're on crutches, they're in a brace, but when the brace comes off, uh, anything goes when they're walking down the hall in high school or they're on the field and they're dying to maybe throw the ball with their, with their friend. Um, but you know, um, I am not holding back with my open chain stuff. I'm doing open chain knee extensions, um, despite what is out there. Um, maybe, uh, my squat, I'm not going like, but to ground when I'm squatting, but I'm going to 70 degrees. Or so I'm not, I'm not trying to get too deep into flexion. Also keep in mind, these people are probably also have a meniscus going on too. Most people have some kind of meniscus injury, a good chunk of them do. So you got to protect the repair as well. So you got to limit the amount of depth you go into with the squat. So I'm protecting not only the, the graft, but I'm protecting uh, the meniscus repair as well. So um, what my limits are, my limits are gonna be basically going to be the person themselves and the symptoms. I don't want to increase pain and swelling by going, being too aggressive. So, but the graft, again, it, it's still vulnerable. The, you know, Holly mentioned bone to bone, bone to bone healing takes at least six weeks, right? You fracture a bone, it's going to take six weeks to heal. So the same thing for, for those bone plugs that probably heal is going to be at least six weeks, right? Um, the, uh, the female athlete, you know, uh, depending on the study, five to eight fold increase uh, in females. Um, Holly, uh, what are the, the basic reasons why females get more ACLs than males generally? It's a great question. Like we published a couple of studies looking at uh, leg dominance, like Rob Brophy and I, a couple of, God, more than a couple of years, <laughs> maybe like a decade ago, but we looked at um, what limb uh, what lower extremity was being torn more frequently. And the only other sport that corroborated what we had found, because most of these studies were done not unique to sport, they were done across just a, the diagnosis. We found that women tend to tear their um, stability limb a little more frequently where men tear their dominant limb. And um, that was also seen in downhill skiers, which is sort of interesting because we don't think of a limb in, in terms of classic dominance like you would in other types of sports. So our thought was like, perhaps women are a little bit more um, symptomatic in the frontal plane, whether it's like a, a real hip ab um, abduction strength phenomenon, are we seeing um, peak knee, uh, peak knee abduction moments that are higher within this cohort. And then in the men, um, is it more of a sagittal plane phenomenon where you see higher numbers of um, quad and patellar tendon avulsions? We don't typically see that in females. So is it more a virtue of some planar instabilities? Now, that being said, we have men that present like women and women that present like men. So I think we can get it can be a little bit difficult biomechanically if we try to parse this too finely because we'll miss out on helping the entire population. So it's very important. I think just scientifically, I try to think of like, oh, how can we make things better? But by making things better, do we then do a disservice to the outliers? So it's, it's, it's interesting. Um, what, what, about, more... what about the, the, the older theories of notch size and also yeah. just yeah. Uh, hip, hip widening in, in, yeah. in women and that? <laughs> post-menopausal, uh, what, what kind of factors yeah. does that go in? Yeah. Uh, well, 
I was part of the Hunt Valley group with Edie Griffin leading the charge and she famously said, so we looked at four bio, the four categorical risk factors and we've added a fifth since, but you're looking at anatomy, environmental risk factors, you're looking at hormonal and then the biomechanical. And now this fifth one that's coming into play is genetics. Like we can talk about genetic predispos predisposition, but Edie, uh, Dr. Griffin very famously said, women's hips aren't wider, it's their, uh, femoral, I'm sorry, your, their hip width to femoral length ratios are very different. And that's so true. So I think this whole thing, I remember, Lynn, you probably remember this back in the 2000s, we had like prophylactic notch plasties yes. happening in Texas is bananas. Like, okay, there's anatomical risk factors. There are environmental things. You're going to go to an away game and things are going to be different. We have to biomechanically and neuro neurologically prepare people for everything. That's our charge. You know, so things are going to be a little bit different. Um, will risk vary, risk ratios vary based on that? Absolutely. But it is our responsibility and our role in this whole is to pre prepare people for that. And I think Holly's shown the, the data are so strong mm -hmm. that if you do a comprehensive um, knee injury risk reduction program, mm -hmm. it's going to, it's going to they work. Be, it's going to work. Mm -hmm. And the younger the the athletes are the better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's a big take home uh, to, tonight. That's for sure. That mm -hmm. is, that is, uh, you have to, uh, you know, I hate to use the word sell, but you have to sell that to parents mm -hmm. and coaches um, mm -hmm. that it's, it's not just a little bit worthwhile. It's a lot yeah. worthwhile. Uh, and, and one thing, and, one, yep, go ahead. So, sorry, one slide I, for, I forgot to add in just based on time, but we have another paper in peer review right now. And we have shown, we look at the performance element of the 11 plus, and we have shown statistically there are more wins and fewer losses in the intervention group that utilize the program. That's our sales pitch, right? And I always say, I don't think I'm make, we're making better soccer players per se. We're just, they're available for selection, right? They're available late in season, late into playoffs. And so if you, that's the conversation we have with the player and the coach, right? So we have to be a little bit selective in how we, we disseminate that type of information. So that should be published hopefully in the next couple of months. Nancy, let's go. Uh, we, we still have over 700 people in, in the room here, so let's just keep going if it's okay with you guys. Uh, Nancy, let's have another, another topic. Okay, for Lynn, a couple questions on the 10 sessions. Uh, the timing between the sessions, but then also practically, how do you deal with insurance restrictions? 10 pre-op visits sound great, but um, in a clinic situation, how do you handle that? Patient pay, out of pocket? Okay, um, so let's start with... Uh, Perturbation training sessions, um, pre, they're talking about pre-op. Um, so the way that we progress them is, it's, is that they can handle it. That means they are able to progress and they don't have any knee pain or swelling. So we've been able to do this in 10 sessions in 10 days. We've been able, you know, on on average, it's a it's probably three to five uh, three to five weeks three to two to three sessions a week <clears throat> to do this. Um, we haven't had a lot of problems with this because in a lot in a lot of cases the clock resets with a surgery with U.S. Um, insurers. So you're starting over with your visits post op. Lenny, do you get that in your clinic? Um, <laughs> we, we, we do, yeah. Um, so not all the time, but enough of the time where we get pre pre op. But I'm a different beast. I'm uh, I'm out of network. I'm cash based. So um, if people see the value and they have done the research on their end, or the doctor told them to do it, it's an easy sell. Um, I see people once a week, uh, one, two times a week at the most, um, and they have my cell phone. They're texting me all day, every day. If they have questions over the weekend, they have access to me whenever they want. So I'm a little different world, but um, yes, we get them. I, I get a kid right now. He's uh, having surgery in early February and I've been rehabbing him for three weeks now. So I'll have him for about four or five weeks before the surgery and um, full range of motion, no swelling, you know, gates getting there, uh, squats a little off. Um, we get some baseline tests on him that I talked about and let, let's roll on February 5th, you know. Good, good. Um, uh, I'll just add one thing. Uh, I'm, uh, our clinic is like uh, uh, Lenny's uh, in that 
uh, we're, we're mostly cash based. So we take some insurance, but, but, um, I think one of the things is you find out whether, uh, people think your programs are worthwhile if they're willing to put cash down, um, and, and do that. Uh, sometimes it's not, uh, it's not equitable because uh, some people don't have the money, uh, and and uh, most times you're trying to make uh, allowances for that. Um, but uh, uh, you see more and more people who won't pay the ten dollar copay because after going to their therapist, uh, it's not worth the ten dollars. So you got to make it worth it. Uh, Nancy, yeah. another thing from the uh, the audience, please. Okay, what criteria do you suggest for returning to running if you work in a clinic that doesn't have equipment to measure squat or deadlift strength? Deadlifts. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah, so, yeah, for, yeah, I mean, that's, you want to measure quad strength. Big, yeah. Figure yeah. out a way to measure yeah. quad strength. Right. Okay. Some. Yeah. Uh, not. Not. I mean, you, you, they, I mean, they should be able to squat and deadlift, right? If they're going to start running. So, I mean, you, I, I, I've been going towards a, a, a percentage body weight. So, hopefully, they can weigh themselves mm -hmm. on a scale at home if you don't can't afford a scale. Um, but otherwise, uh, try to get them to at least half their body weight. If they weigh 150 mm -hmm. pounds, they should be able to squat 75. 75 pounds, you know, something like that. Mm -hmm. That's a nice, easy way. You can buy a handheld dynamometer. That's what I do. They're about $800, $1,000. Mm -hmm. um, it's not a break the bank. You get something. You get some information. But again, mm -hmm. like Lynn said, it's, it, 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 take it's with a pretty, grain of salt. And you can. Go it's ahead. pretty good. I mean, if you mm -hmm. want to measure yeah. quad strength, you, yeah. you should you got to use something and the handheld yeah. dynamometer yeah. using a, a strap is a, yeah. is a, you know, just go, mm -hmm. you know, not your hands. Right. Right. Um, you just need, need it to be a little bit higher, but we, we, we use, uh, still back to the old fashioned, right. Isokinetics yeah. or isometrics on right. an isokinetic dynamometer. Plus again, they need to have full range of motion, no effusion. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. and no knee pain when right. you know no joint pain right. so well, we've also been holding off more because we're longer uh, again we're seeing lenny, lenny described this we're seeing more and more meniscal repairs as time goes on because there are more gadgets that docs even in the community can use um so since if they're not going back, we don't till nine to 12 months, we don't really need them running that early. We have a lot of other things that they could be doing. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. and, and so for us, it's 80% quad strength, no effusion or trace to no effusion, mm -hmm. full range of motion, no knee pain, mm -hmm. no, joint pain when they're like doing something, landing on it or doing something like hopping on a, on the carpet or something. Mm -hmm. So I, I, if she, her quite, I, I don't know if it was a he or she, um, the person's question um, said if they can't measure squat or deadlift strength, mm -hmm. I think mm -hmm. you need to figure out a way to get a squat and a deadlift into their program because they're, they're vital movements. And so mm -hmm. if your clinic is not squatting and deadlifting heavy, mm -hmm. um, you need to figure out a way for them to squat and deadlift heavy. And then you'll be able to measure that stuff. It, it, critical movements, right? For posterior mm -hmm. chain and for quad strength. So you have to. So holding a, a two 10, 10 pound dumbbells in each hand and squatting at month six is not enough for a 180 pound high school kid. It, it really is. You need, you need better equipment. And that's where we're failing uh, in our PT clinics because we are not loading people. I just had a 135 pound female lacrosse player. She just goblet squatted 70 pounds. She just did almost half her body weight today. Mm -hmm. And she's 10 mm -hmm. weeks out of surgery. You know what I mean? She, mm -hmm. she has to. You have to do that stuff. You yeah. know, uh, it's critical. And so in my mm -hmm. head, she just mm -hmm. hit 50% of her body weight to squat. Mm -hmm. And she's only 10 weeks out. And, and we're on a good road. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So I'm not doing like wall sits for 10 seconds or, mm -hmm. um, you know, a, a step down, body weight step downs at, at five months out of surgery. Mm -hmm. It's just, it's not enough. And that's where we're failing. That's why our, our limb symmetry ind indices are, are, are pitiful at, mm -hmm. at six months, nine months out because we're, we're just not overloading the muscle. Yeah, I think progressive, you got to be, you've got to be progressing your rehab. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to really oh, I, progress them. Right. And I progress more than you think. They can do yeah. more than you think. When I, when we handed her a 70 pound dumbbell today, she looked at us like we were crazy. I got a hundred and 120 pound kid. He's goblet squatting like 60 pounds. 
He's got the 50 million. It's a little, a little 15 year old kid. And he's like, no way can I do that. If you put it up on a box and they just have to grab it, hold it, and squat it, they can do it. The hard, the biggest challenge is for them to pick it up off the ground and, and be able to gobble squat it. Put it on a box, and I guarantee they're gonna they're gonna do more than you think, and they're gonna be like they're gonna feel jacked, and, and it's gonna be better for their quads mm -hmm. when it's appropriate. And mm -hmm. they don't get swelling and pain afterwards or anterior knee pain, you know, patella tendon. Pain. Yeah, and looking but and being I, just really mindful qualitatively. I think that's one of the criticisms of some of the hop testing. It's like building in the qualitative assessment. And that's my practice is just like yours, Lenny, fortunately. And I have that ability to oversee that entire hour. You know, it's me and that person. Yeah. So so there yeah. we're lucky. We're super lucky because there's this immense yes. qualitative component to it. But also the parity between because I see so many people focus on that, but make sure that deadlift looks similar and can go equally is heavy right is that squat in right. a lot of ways yeah 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 absolutely they can deadlift a lot more than you think and i think mm -hmm. maybe maybe at that point when insurance runs out that's when mm -hmm. you start working with pt clinics in your area that are like uh what i have and what holly uh has as well is that out of network cash based thing where mm -hmm. you've re developed a relationship with them and, and it's yeah. in the best interest of the patient at that point is mm -hmm. to say you know I, I get this all the time from from uh, other pt clinics around boston they send them to me because they know I can take over now at four or five months mm -hmm. out of surgery because they've mm -hmm. exhausted their insurance business. It's not, a, it's the, yeah, it, it, unfortunately mm -hmm. it happens. And that, again, that mm -hmm. was one of my points in the slide was insurance is a huge limitation. So it is mm -hmm. what it is, but develop relationships with PTs in your, in your community. And mm -hmm. I guarantee that teamwork is going to open up avenues for mm -hmm. you with more patients coming into your facility because they're mm -hmm. going to see that teamwork. Develop relationships with strength coaches. You know, um, at that point, there it's a strengthening program. That's all it is. So you're going to run the show, but the strength coach is programming and, and something like that. Boy, you have this program in your facility. You mm -hmm. hire a strength coach, and now he or she is running the program, mm -hmm. cash based. So, you know, like, I, there's I, so many different avenues. So you guys are both doing that, and I'm in a fairly conventional university based practice, right? Outpatient practice. And mm -hmm. one thing that I can tell you is if you, if you measure, if you document, if you're, you're actually doing progressive work and you show mm -hmm. that a lack of progression or we need to get to here, we haven't had a lot of problems getting extra visits. So the hard part is most people don't document, most people don't measure. Mm -hmm. So, and they're not being progressive. So you've got to be showing that what you're doing and you have to have benchmarks and if yeah, you do I, I, I mean everybody can't go cash based everybody admits right. that right right so for those of you who yeah. are working in practices that are that that deal with all different kinds of insurances that your best way to get more business is to document mm -hmm. and measure measure and document mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah I, I i just want to echo all that uh in regards to that um, uh, and there, we find the same thing that Lenny's finding is that uh, we're kind of baseball oriented. Uh, we see mostly baseball players at different levels. And what we get referrals to is the, the, the UCL reconstruction uh, when they start to throw their throwing program because uh, we're kind of the closers. We're the people who get them back on the field. Uh, uh, unfortunately, when we get them at five or six months, you have to take a couple weeks or even longer to get them where they should have been at five or six months mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. in order to get them to where they do because if you just go with in in baseball or a throwing program you end up with the problem mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. another another que uh, another question all right looking um at the hop testing do you look at contact time on the ground at all no <laughs> That was, I, I that was easy. <laughs> I, I, no, I don't because I don't do hop tests. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Uh, I, I use them how, qualitatively. Like, how how yeah, they're moving. I mean, uh, how are we going to do that? Like, how do you yeah. measure if they have a hip strategy versus a knee strategy? Mm -hmm. How do you measure the amount of frontal plane movement? How do you measure the contact time on the ground? Mm -hmm. Like, Who has this stuff? People are cheating with hop tests all the time. It's telling them if, if they can hop. Like, I, it blows my mind, and Lynn's going to... Let's go. I'm, I'm actually not going to because the, I think okay, part, of, part of the argument that you made is like hop tests are the thing, right? Mm -hmm. So we use a it's battery right. of tests of mm -hmm. which yes. those are one. Right. And mm -hmm. that right. tells me a lot about a lot of things because mm -hmm. we're looking at how they're hopping. We're looking at their distance. 
that also measures their confidence on that in that limb. I'm sure you're getting at that from other things. Yeah. So mm -hmm. taking yes. pump shots at hop tests is probably not, you know, it's like it's a cheap and shot. I know it's like me saying, I, 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 don't do BFR, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. And in you know, all due respect, if you really want to get a kick out of life on social media, follow these watch two, us. two people right. on, on uh, Lenny and I agree <laughs> almost always on social media. We hardly ever disagree. Yes, we, we do. We do. Yeah. Yeah. We, we do. I, I just, uh, I see it a lot out there and I, I talk with docs all the time. I talked with a doc uh, last week. He's like, yeah, can you get some hop tests on my guy? Um, and I was like, yeah, 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 I'll do it. And I'm never going to do it. I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm just, I'm not going to do it because I just, done it ever? I, I, I just, I have once, you ever done it once in my career. And I was, I was freaking out. Um, no, okay. it was, it was, an, it was an NBA guy and I just, I freaked out. He did fine, but I, I, I don't Come do it. Um, it, I, I, it uh, visit us for a week or okay. eat the, the day. The moderator, is, the moderator is losing control here. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, um, uh, uh, I know there, there's a, still about 500 people on on thing, but uh, you can see that uh, this is the kind of discussions that typically happen um, when when you don't have COVID and you can go to the bar and, and mm -hmm. actually have these debates. Uh, hopefully we'll get back to that at some point, I hope. Um, uh, I, I miss the bar a lot. Uh, and uh, uh, so listen, I, I think we're going to wrap it up here um, and appreciate you guys staying longer and appreciate and the number of people who stayed on. Uh, I know this gets late, especially for the East Coast people. They always in our polls tell us that we're unfair, we're uh, West Coast bay, uh, biased, but uh, uh, we have to listen to ESPN, so they're always East Coast, Coast bay biased. Um, but listen, thank you very, very much um, and really appreciate it. Remember everybody who's still on um, uh, to do that survey so we can get your uh, CEUs to you. And in regards to PTs, I didn't mention this, we will send you a certificate. Every state's different, um, so you just have to present it to your state. But we, you will get a certificate of completion, okay, as long as you do the survey. So, all right. Thank you and uh, good night. Thank you guys. Really appreciate it. Pleasure. It was a lot of fun. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Bye, Bye, Bye. Bye Holly. Bye bye, guys. You, Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Uh -huh. Uh, give me a call. <laughs>